Good morning. My name is Kevin Healy. I'm senior counsel at Brian Cave Leighton Paisner's office in New York. I'm also the co-chair of the New York City Bar Association Environmental Law Committee. On behalf of my co-chair, uh, Amy Turner, again. And, the, uh, and, and the city bar, can people hear me okay? Yeah. And the, uh, and the city bar, I'd like to welcome you to our uh, Earth Day conference on climate change. At the outset, I'd like to, uh, to uh, thank our co-sponsors, the New York State Bar Association, Environmental and Energy Law Section, and the New York City Climate Action Alliance, who are, as I said, co-sponsoring the conference today. I'd also like to give a shout out to Matthew Sinkman and Carl Howard for the hard work that they've put in in organizing the, co the conference. And finally, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Martha Harris, Lisa Bataille, and Kevin Magyoff for their hard work in putting the logistics of the conference together. Uh, Kevin is the technical wizard behind the curtain here, who hopefully is going to make uh, the conference today uh, run smoothly. So here we are, a half century after the environmental movement began. Who would have thought that we would be celebrating this anniversary by sheltering in place from a pandemic? And who would have dreamed that we'd be facing the alarming state of affairs which, which we are facing on the problem of climate change? As uh, many of you know, a three-judge panel in the Ninth Circuit recently dis dismissed the constitutional claims brought by children facing a climate future in Juliana versus the United States. Um, those of you who are not lawyers might be puzzled to know that before doing that, before uh, uh, directing the dismissal of that case, the court found that, quote, copious expert evidence establishes that global warming linked to the burning of fossil fuels, quote, will wreak havoc on Earth's climate, climate if unchecked. The court found that the problem is, uh, uh, is approaching the point of no return, that's a quote, and that without action, here comes a quote, the destabilizing climate will bury cities, spawn life-threatening natural disasters, and jeopardize critical food supplies. I, I, um, I, I, I cite this case just uh, to give you some grounding as to where things stand on climate change. This is not an environmental advocacy group that's saying this. This is the Ninth Circuit, a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit. I recommend that you read the, uh, the court decision in Juliana and also read the dissenting opinion. Um, I think that if you do so, you will, uh, oh, let me put it this way, I suggest that you don't do so late at night because uh, the opinion and the dissenting opinion certainly are alarming and they're both quite frustrating as well. Um, it's, it is a strange thing, lawyers would understand why the, the case was dismissed on, uh, for lack of standing. The, so lawyers would understand why the court on the one hand would find these horrendous uh, potential injuries to the plaintiffs and on the other hand uh, dismiss the case. I expect this conference will also give you a good sense of the urgency of the climate crisis, but I also hope it's going to uh, energize you and prompt you to do your part in dealing with this problem. I believe that uh, we're going to be able to energize you for a couple of reasons. First of all, we're going to be talking quite a bit today, certainly in the first panel, about resilience. We're also going to be talking about what the state and the city of New York have done and will be doing in the coming years on climate. Um, unlike the federal government, New York State has not been spinning its wheels for, de for decades on climate change, and there's a good reason for that. Climate has never been a partisan issue in the state of New York. And now we are poised to become worldwide leaders really on the climate issue if we do things right. Landmark climate laws have just been passed by both the state and the city of New York. And, uh, and, and now we have the opportunity to turn the goals that are set forth in these two incredible statutes into reality. But doing so is going to require an awful lot of work, work by government officials, environmental and community ad advocates, businesses, scientists, and lawyers. And I'm proud to say that uh, lawyers work has already gotten started. I expect that Mike Girard is gonna be talking a little bit 
uh, in uh, his presentation about the, um, the project that the Saving Center at Columbia Law has going, where they've signed up, uh, I think it's more than 20 major law firms to draft the legal documents that are needed in order to advance more than a thousand pathways to deep decarbonization. A few years ago, the New York City uh, Bar Association organized a task force on climate uh, uh, adaptation. And, uh, and that uh, task force chaired by uh, Steve Kass um, issued a spectacular report with a whole series of recommendations on how to approach the issue. And let me zoom in for a quick second on, um, on another thing that lawyers have been doing, if I, if I can, hold on one sec. Um, so, sorry. the New York City um, Climate Action Alliance is collaborating with NYSERDA on a, a project called the Law Firm Engagement Project. The idea behind this project is that law firms occupy a lot of office space and NYSERDA on the other hand has a terrific program aimed at making uh, office space energy efficient. So the idea behind, the, behind this project is uh, that uh, there should be a match between the two things. So the project aims to make law firms aware of the benefits of the program with the expectation that once they know about these benefits, they'll take advantage of them. And the benefits can be very substantial. White & Case is one of the firms that, uh, that has entered into the program and gone through the program, and it estimates it, it is saving more than $400,000 each year as a result of uh, the improvements that it has, uh, that it has made of the, of the program. Now, last year, the, uh, under the program, last year, the city bar um, honored the uh, firms that have been uh, that had gone through the, uh, uh, the NYSERDA program. And uh, for obvious reasons, we can't do that this year. So I've put up uh, the names of some of the firms that uh, some of the major firms that have uh, gone through the program. And that's one part of the list. And here's the second part of the list. So the, um, the, uh, the, these law firms should feel very good that they've done uh, uh, their part and that they're saving some serious money as a result. So uh, now let's get started on the first panel, which will discuss uh, uh, resilience. Our first speaker will be uh, Sarah Kapnick, who is a physical scientist and the deputy division leader at NOAA's, NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. Um, next up after her will be Alice Hill, who is Senior Fellow for Climate Change at the Council on Foreign Relations and uh, who was formerly with the White House and the Department of Homeland Security. Then Tommy Vest, General Counsel of the New York City Mayor's Office on Resil Resiliency will speak and wrapping it up will be Anel Hernandez, Associate Director of the New York City um, Environmental Justice Alliance. So here's how it's gonna work. The speakers will each give their presentations and after they're all through we'll, uh, with their presentations, we'll take questions. The way to ask questions is you'll see a, a Q&A um, uh, 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 little screen, little thing on uh, the bottom of your screen. And uh, you click on that, uh, on that icon and then type the question in and send it along. I'll then read it and I'll read it out loud so the respondents, uh, uh, the, uh, the panelists can respond uh, as time allows. All right, now let's get going. I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to, to Sarah. But I don't know how. Kevin, do you know how? I'm here. Okay, thank no you, Sarah. Um, thank you for, for that introduction. And, oh, is it not working? Oh, you have to stop. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get out. I'll get out now. Okay. Am I out? I believe you are. Does that work? Um, 
So thank you for that introduction. I'm here to talk about um, the science behind um, what we know about climate change, um, particularly in the Northeast region. Oops. Okay. So uh, since this is a heavy legal panel and um, I thought that I would give a little background of who I am and what I do, because um, you might not be used to talking to climate scientists. So I'm a climate scientist at the NOAA, at the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, which is an agency that sits under the Department of Commerce. Our mission is understanding uh, weather, climate, and water, and the coasts, um, and understanding, um, mapping them, understanding them, historically understanding them now, and then projecting um, and predicting what will happen into the future. So I work at uh, NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, which is the, one of the major research laboratories. It's based down in Princeton um, University's Forest Hill campus. Um, and it's where we first developed climate models. So in the 1960s, the development of the first climate models in the world were developed in GFTL. Um, we develop, we continue to develop both climate models as well as um, infrastructure for weather models. So when you look at your phone for your app of your weather forecast, that's actually coming from technology. Um, technology underpinning the national weather model actually came out of my laboratory. Um, so we are at the um, one of the main laboratories in the United States that's developing climate models and um, weather to climate models and modeling um, to understand climate. Um, and the way that we do this is using um, very large supercomputers um, to develop these. These are models that are run not, can't be run on a laptop. They're actually run on some of the largest computers in the world. So this is actually a picture of the guy, a supercomputer that's in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, they put a pretty picture on front, but it's basically a giant warehouse that has um, computer uh, servers and servers to, um, for us to be able to make our calculations. Um, and so I sit for my office, normally in Princeton, New Jersey, but right now um, at home where I live in New York City. Um, and I develop these models and then we um, look at the, the data that's coming out of them to understand um, the climate, how it varies in time and how it's changing. So um, through NOAA and as climate scientists, um, how do we wet monitor weather and climate? So there's two major ways. We can look at the observed climate. So we have observations um, of the climate system to be able to understand how it's been changing over time. So on the top picture here with all these blue dots, those are stations across all the United States um, where we have temperature and precipitation data that we can look at how these um, values are changing over time. In the center you have, um, it's actually a picture on the bottom left here is precipitation gauge. So that's actually how you know how much water is falling is um, there's a little gauge in, in the middle of this giant um, fence. And then you have um, other temperature data and solar data and humidity and um, taken from these monitors. Um, and we have stations across the United States. And this is, um, these are more complex monitors that we use and there's um, fewer of them and they've only been around more recently. And then on the very bottom, um, I just have a picture of the GOES um, 16 satellites. We also have satellite data and that starts in the 1980s that we can use this data to understand how the climate varies in time and how it might be changing um, historically. So we have our observations, but we also have climate models. Um, and with the climate models, um, we use them to develop, um, oops, we use the climate models to be able to um, create experiments with different worlds. And with those different worlds, um, we can actually ask the questions of how has the climate been changing over time, historically to present, and then how is it going to change into the future? And models are extremely powerful as well because we can also um, make perfect scenarios, we can make scenarios where we look at how the climate could have changed if you remove something that's changed in the climate system. So if you have greenhouse gases changing or if you have aerosols changing or you have solar cycles changing or you remove that and keep them constant, we can actually see how the um, climate might respond. And then as we look into the future, we can use the various scenarios um, to understand how you um, alter climate as well, be it farming practices and land use, greenhouse gases, aerosols, um, changes in wildfire. 
And so together we have the observed climate and the, um, historically, and then we have all the model simulations that we can use to create various worlds to understand how the climate has changed and to be able to attribute those changes to these different factors. So I was asked um, to talk mainly about weather extremes today. So a weather event, an uh, extreme weather event can be defined as something that causes harm to lives and property. Um, however, in statistics and in science, um, we use these extreme events to refer to low probability events um, that are in the tail of the distribution. Um, so if you have a distribution of probability of events, the average value you know, often happens the most frequently, and then you can have um, a positive or negative extreme. So there's a difficulty in quantifying extreme risks and extreme, the probability of extreme events because by definition, they don't happen often. So we can rely on our historical observations that we have, um, and we do use the historical observations to understand um, climate, how it varied over time, but we can also use our models to generate large data sets to be, under, be able to understand um, the probability of these events as well as their causes. Okay. And so we use all this climate data to answer questions about um, climate extremes and how they changed over time. So um, the questions we ask, has the climate been changing in the past? For specific climate extremes, what is the probability of that? Um, is that probability or the type of event changing? Why is it changing? Um, what is the probability going to be in the future? Can we project what it will be in the future? Um, what, and then importantly, not only in calculating these risks, is also um, understanding the uncertainty in the quantification. So how well do we know what we know? And then beyond this, um, the question mission from NOAA is how might we use this to improve protect, and protect lives and property. So um, in New York and the Northeast region that we're a part of, um, the major extreme event risks that we face are heat, um, so heat waves, extreme heat, um, lack of precipitation, this is a picture of very dry soils during a drought. We face coastal and river flooding, um, so when you either have storm surge risk that comes up along the coast and bring storm surge on the coast. Um, you can also have river flooding that pushes up the water upstream that causes flooding, but you can also get um, river flooding from extreme precipitation events. So you have a lot of water dumped from the sky in, in a location that causes the rivers to flood or localized flooding. We also face winter storms. Um, so extreme snowfall, extreme winds, um, nor'easters, you see hearing about those. And then the other major event risks that we have here um, in weather risk is, are hurricanes or tropical storms. Um, so this is actually a uh, satellite picture of Sandy, which we all remember from causing problems in the New York City area in 2012. So um, going through these different types of events, I thought I would um, talk about what the climate change risk is for these different events. Um, going into the future and what we know, how they're changing. So I'll start with um, a bit of an easier one. So changes in winter storms and snowfall. Um, when we project changes in snowfall and changes in winter storms into the future, um, in the future we expect um, less average snowfall across most of the lower, for, oh, across the lower 48 into the, um, over the next seven years. Um, so this picture on the right is um, change in the percentage of average snowfall um, into the future. On the left hand side, these are changes in East Coast high wind and snow events. So that's a definition for a type of blizzard. So when you have a lot of wind and you have extreme snowfall, these are also expected to decline in many parts um, of the US East Coast. Um, however, if there is uncertainty, in changes in these extreme storms and extreme snowfall. Um, and actually it's at the most extreme storms, um, there's, there's uncertainty in what's gonna happen. So actually we, we see average snowfall will decline. We'll see snowfall um, at lower levels will decline. These are probably um, differences in frequency of events 
um, from the present to the future. And so we expect that you'll have declines in snowfall mining lower levels, but actually in the most highest levels of snowfall, um, statistically we actually see the emergence that there may be a likelihood for more extreme snowfall in the most extreme. So from a management perspective, this creates problems because if you're um, managing your budget for snow removal and you have an average amount of snow that you expect and that's declining, you have an expectation that you'll have to deal with snow less and less. However, if your probability of this really extreme storms, the storms that are going to shut everything down for a few days, um, is increasing, um, becomes a question of how do you plan for those really extreme events if you become used to an to a environment where your likelihood of um, blizzards and blizzard days overall, or snowfall days overall, is, is declining. Um, the next major storm that I thought I would hit on is tropical cyclones and hurricanes. So hurricanes are tropical cyclones of winds above 74 miles per hour. When we study them climatically, we usually um, classify total tropical cyclones um, because it provides you with more frequency of more storms. Um, changes in hurricanes are actually something that has been hard to quantify. So we only have satellite data that allows us to look at where tropical cyclones have been really reliably since the 1980s. Um, but with that, this picture that I provide you with is changes in tropical cyclones um, from 1980 to 2018, um, where you have more storms in these reds and yellows, fewer storms in greens and blues. So in the North Atlantic, the Caribbean, we've been seeing a trend towards increasing tropical cyclones um, in our region. And there's actually a lot of uncertainty of how many storms there's going to be um, projected into the future in this region. Um, there's, um, there's a study that is coming out very shortly, and they have actually come out this morning, that is showing that there may be um, uncertainty um, around the future that we, that many models are projecting there's actually might be a decline in storms in the Atlantic um, going forward. Um, but that uncertainty of that is around the role of aerosols, um, really air pollution, so particles in the air, may actually um, be helping um, drive those changes. Um, and so the changes in the aerosols um, going to the end of the century, if you reduce aerosols, you may actually increase um, the risk of tropical cyclones in our region. Um, so it's it's, there's a lot more uncertainty with, with, with how the number of tropical cyclones are going to change by the end of the century where we live. So they've been increasing the last several decades, but towards the end of the century, um, there's a lot more uncertainty of how tropical cyclones are going to change. However, even if tropical cyclones do not change and they remain the same, um, the, we have a risk in our coastal regions um, due to sea level rise. So sea level rise in the region has increased by approximately a foot since 1900. Sea level rises, um, global sea levels rise due to two reasons. So water, as it gets warmer, it actually expands. So as you have global warming and temperatures increasing, you have the oceans um, increasing in temperature and the water expands, driving sea level rise. And you also have melting of glaciers and ice sheets. So even if storms stay the same, and tropical cyclones stay the same, winter blizzards stay the same, your storm risk, surge risk actually increases because you're increasing the level of where the water is. Um, and so as you increase the level of water, the same amount of flooding from a storm surge risk today in the future will cause more flooding inland um, if nothing has changed um, to develop coastal communities to be more resilient to that change in sea level rise. When you look at the different scenarios for what this suggests for New York City and the surrounding area, um, by 2060, um, the scenarios for intermediate low, our lowest scenarios that we um, have been looking at, you have a roughly one foot rise. When you go to the more extreme levels, you have between the three foot and five foot rise. So looking at these different scenarios, um, that's a difference in many locations um, that we look at between a dry average region um, when you, on an average day, to these regions being underwater. So I actually pulled this 
from the viewer that NOAA provides. You can actually log in there and you can look at many different locations in the United States. You can see the different scenarios and different um, and different sites around the United States and see what the sea level rise means. And so for Coney Island, that means that you actually are, are in a state where you're fully underwater um, by the end of the, by 2060 under the more extreme cases. Um, to put in perspective, I have young children. That's when my children are around my age now. <clears throat> so with coastal adaptions and changes as you have sea level rise, um, you have a number of areas that are impacted. So with sea level rise, you, um, you remove land along the coast. So homes around, along the coast, you, you lose homes in infrastructure and um, developments that you have along the coast as the sea level comes in and you have storms that take um, structures away. Other possible features as you are trying to build more resilience to communities, people um, try to build in physical barriers to reduce sea level, um, to reduce erosion and reduce the intrusion of water into further inland. Um, you also have the barrier islands and you have um, sea level and storm surge risk um, removes the barrier islands, it can make them more narrow, it, complete, it alters the, um, the type of um, ecosystems that thrive in those regions. Um, and in this picture, um, the USGS did, uh, doesn't have any homes on the barrier islands, but along the coast of the Northeast, um, barrier islands have been built on, they have a lot of built environment, there's concrete, there's, um, those are high value homes that are along the um, coast, and those are the regions that are very vulnerable to sea level rise and erosion um, with climate change over the next century. So in this picture, um, you would be adding um, you have fire island, you'd be adding homes to these locations and with sea level rise and erosion, you're removing that over the next century. So even um, without changes in storms and storm surge risk, you're removing um, the land around those places. Um, another major risk, extreme precipitation. Extreme precipitation causes um, flooding, it can damage crops, it leads to water quality issues because if you have water runoff through um, farmland and cities really, really quickly, um, it pulls all the um, it pulls all the chemicals and oil and debris or anything that's on the surface and it goes straight into the sewers and it cause, um, and rivers and it cause water quality problems. Um, so in the Northeast, um, historically over the last several decades, we've seen the greatest increase in um, total annual precipitation falling in the um, one percent events. So one percent events are three days out of the year, the extreme precipitation, those are events have been, has been increasing. And when we project that into the future in our region, um, we also see increases in events. In the mediums or lower scenarios, we see um, moderate increases in extreme precipitation of 20 to 30 percent, but then when you move up into the higher scenarios, you have more than 40 percent um, increase in extreme precipitation rates in our region. And so extreme precipitation in our region is expected to increase. This can increase flood risks, damage to crops, and water quality issues. Um, <clears throat> I added this. Um, also, it, so heat waves as well um, are expected to increase um, in our region. So average temperature is going up, but we also expect to have increase in um, number of days a year where you have extreme heat. Um, extreme, I think someone else in the panel will talk at one point about this, but you can also expect heat, there are heat related deaths also to extreme heat um, because people have heat, heat stroke um, and then, um, and so with the higher scenarios, we expect thousands of people um, in, along the Northeast to increase um, in deaths due to heat waves. There's another type um, of days that we look at um, that are similar to heat waves, these um, that are complementary to heat waves, they're mild weather days. These are days when it's not too hot, not too cold, no precipitation, low dew point. Um, these, these days are expected to dramatically decline. These, these you can also call these days um, no heating, no cooling days. Um, so we typically have 44 of them in New York City during the summer, and we're expected to lose 17 um, by the end of the century. And so, um, so this, red, this red across the United States is all the places that are gonna lose mild weather days. Um, and those are being replaced by heat wave days, by extreme um, and days with more extreme precipitation. 
so if you think about it, these are the days where you want to be outside and are very pleasant. And these are the days that we're losing um, to more extremes. So um, with this, as climate scientists and for my work, um, we're trying to provide risk assessments um, for after events happen to understand the likelihood of events today, the cause of events, and how they're changing. Um, and with all this information, we're trying to be able to provide it um, to other decision makers so you, can, um, so you can try and reduce the impacts. So we are trying to figure out, are these events predictable? How far in advance? Um, we're trying to predict create prediction systems so we can provide people with more information for preparation weeks, months, seasons, years in advance. Um, we're trying to apply our knowledge of these risks um, to provide operational data to be able to help um, avoid the risks associated with these extreme events. And then a major question for me also with giving um, this talk to everyone is how can we provide better data um, for others to make it useful um, to what you need? to make your decisions. Um, so I'm at 9.30, so I'll be very quick, but I, I added in here um, places you can go to get more information. So there's actually, so NOAA has these uh, regional climate centers. Um, I'm part of the Northeast, where you can go and you can go to the regional climate centers and directors to be able to get more information about climate in your region, how it's changing. There's also state climatologists. Each, almost each state has a state climatologist that um, holds the official state information and can provide, um, can provide service of understanding how climate changes your region. Um, there's NOAA produces a billion weather, um, dollar weather and climate risk disasters page. You can find all the information about the major disasters and the costs in the United States. There's, a, there's the climate assessment that comes out every couple of years that gives a state of the climate in the United States. Um, and there's also resiliency toolkits um, where you can actually get more information and data um, that's provided in an easily packaged form. Um, and so with that, I thank you. I'll move on to the next panelist. Thank you, Sarah. That was terrific. Next up is um, Alice uh, Hill, who's Senior Fellow for Climate Change at the Council of Foreign Relations. Alice, you're on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sarah, for that excellent presentation. Uh, I am going to share my screen here. Just start the slideshow. Let's see. All right, um, my name is Alice Hill. I have had a peripatetic career. I am a lawyer by training. I started my career in Los Angeles. I was with the US Attorney's Office there. I eventually headed their white collar crime unit. And then I became a Los Angeles Superior Court judge, uh, was on the bench for 13 years. I made a dramatic career shift to join the Obama administration in 2009. I share that with you because I was a lawyer with basically no understanding of climate change until I did join the Obama administration in 2009. And uh, for those of you who wonder how someone can go from being a state court judge to working at the Department of Homeland Security and then the White House, uh, my simple answer to you is be nice to those you sit next to in law school. I sat next to Janet Napolitano, who uh, became Secretary of Homeland Security and is now president of the UC system. She invited me to join her at the Department of Homeland Security. That was in 2009, and that was right when President Obama issued one of his very first executive orders on climate change. That executive order required a variety of things, including that all federal agencies cut their emissions, but it also, for the first time, required agencies to look at the risks, the physical risks that they would face to their operations and their missions. Department of Homeland Security, as you'll recall, was born out of the events of 9-11. It was uh, a shotgun marriage, lots of different agencies there, FEMA, Coast Guard, immigration. So in 2009, there was a real question, how much would the impacts of climate change affect operations of this huge, basically, security agency. 
Uh, we assembled a task force. We worked with the task force that the Navy had assembled and all of us had what I consider our collective aha moment where we realized that basically it would affect everything going forward. And that's what we're beginning to see and that's what Sarah has shared. So let me go to my next uh, slide here. Let's just go here. Oops. So Superstorm Sandy was referenced. It hit uh, New York. All you New Yorkers will remember, I would say that was the aha moment for the federal government writ large. Uh, that storm as it headed up uh, the coast of the Atlantic took a uh, what was deemed an unusual turn to the left. It hit at high tide in October just before the election. It was a full moon uh, and it created enormous damage. Now, of course, New York, as you'll recall, was getting prepared. This is a picture of the U.S. Uh, Stock Exchange. They put some sandbags before them. Mayor, then Mayor uh, Mike Bloomberg ordered 375,000 people to evacuate. Uh, many measures were being taken. These uh, subway systems were closed. Uh, New York basically shut down. Goldman Sachs uh, took a lot more measures than the stock exchange. They posted 25,000 sandbags in front of their headquarters and they'd also done some major flood proofing before the storm hit. The storm came in at uh, a very high storm surge. It had been predicted that the maximum storm surge would be somewhere around uh, 11 to 12 feet. The storm surge, and that's that wall of water that high winds can push forward onto land, came in at close to 14 feet. It almost immediately overcame barriers and uh, flooded uh, lower Manhattan. That flood uh, contributed to the explosion of an electrical substation. Power went out. Eight million people eventually during the storm lost power. The storm was so large, it stretched a thousand miles and affected 24 states. Manhattan, the city that never sleeps, plunged into darkness. That building that's all lit up on the skyline, that is Goldman Sachs. Uh, they managed to keep their power on uh, and keep operational, but you see the rest of Manhattan was indeed uh, in darkness. Alice, this is Kevin. Um, for some reason, panel, the uh, audience is telling me that for some reason the slides are not uh, are not changing. And uh, uh, well, uh, let me see. Man, oh, between that's Kevin yeah. M and you, maybe we can make that. Um, Alice, uh, yes. just exit full screen on your on your end and just uh, click through your slides. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Okay. Just share your screen, not just a Okay, program. there we go. I'll just go this way then. Is that yeah, going? Yeah, just do that. Uh, you're on slide two, just click on slide three and keep going. Okay. You've been stuck on Superstorm Sandy, so yeah. Okay, so this is the US Stock Exchange. This is uh, Goldman Sachs, are you seeing that? The electrical substation explodes, and here is Goldman Sachs all lit up. Now the subway stations had only uh, planned for a maximum of six feet of uh, storm surge. So those barriers were insufficient. This is a picture of South Ferry Station that opened just uh, less than three years before Sandy hit. It had been opened at the cost of a half a billion dollars. Uh, as you can see, it filled completely with uh, water. That's both salt water and wastewater that spilled as a result of the wastewater treatment plants losing uh, electricity. That filled to 80 feet. Uh, the head of the Metropolitan Transit Authority deemed it a giant fish tank. Uh, and from there, I would say that New York, as Kevin has alluded to, uh, definitely uh, got busy, including the New York Bar, uh, looking at better ways for New York to be prepared. During Sandy, we also learned that if you do not have power, it's very difficult to have fuel. Um, even in the areas that were dry, we couldn't get adequate fuel from uh, the ports 
to the locations and we saw a fuel line start and then we had to start rationing fuel. The healthcare system uh, was under extreme stress, uh, different from what we're experiencing now in the pandemic. Uh, this stress was actually to our physical buildings themselves. Uh, we had discovered that we put generators in the basement. When the water comes in, the generators flood. Uh, and this is a picture of uh, patients being evacuated down darkened stairwells with just a flashlight. Uh, and that was uh, occurring across the city. Eventually 6,500 patients had to be evacuated from hospitals. And then we discovered that everything as it is now globally and also in our city, so interdependent, once one sector goes down, the electric setter, sector, everything else starts to fall apart. This is a picture of Goldman Sachs all lit up, the one building that uh, was doing well. In fact, Gary Cohn, who was then the COO of Goldman Sachs, eventually became uh, Trump's economic advisor. He said uh, during the time, you know, our buildings did pretty well, but in fact, uh, it was, the problem was how was, how were our workers going to get to work? And you can see the car floating in front and that is emblematic of how difficult it will be for us to build resilience. We can't be islands unto ourselves. We have to build resilience for entire systems. So Sarah has alluded to this. We've seen an increase in billion dollar events in recent years. Those are just single events that cost more than a billion dollars or more. We're on an upward climb. We are also uh, have moved to a system where basically the federal government has acted as the ultimate insurer. The payouts by the federal government have also grown exponentially as these events occur with greater severity, particularly uh, since post 2000, we're seeing a lot more. This is the same picture of the billion dollar events. You can see they're widely spread across the United States. This is for 2019. One important thing to uh, recognize is that NOAA, when it assesses these billion dollar events, counts wildfires as one. Uh, and so in 2017 and 2018, when we had the terrible wildfire seasons in California, they were simply counted as one. This is extraordinary level of events occurring. And by the way, we're about to head into, in the midst of this COVID pandemic that will greatly stress, uh, it already is greatly stressing our emergency managers. We're about to head into hurricane season. NOAA has predicted a uh, bigger than normal hurricane season. Uh, NOAA has also predicted flooding in uh, at least 24 states in the spring from extreme precipitation. And then this is for 2020. And then our wildfire season is predicted to be worse. This will be a very difficult situation for first responders as they try to figure out what to do with uh, people who may be infected and also their ability to organize and be in locations together as they need to social distance. Uh, really an unprecedented situation to have a pandemic plus these extreme weather events happening at the same time. We've seen some other Aha moments like Sandy since uh, 2012. This is Houston submerged uh, during Hurricane Harvey, five feet of rain, close to five feet of rain, falling on a pancake flat city that had basically not invested deeply in land use or building codes. Uh, extreme damage from that. Uh, this is a picture of Puerto Rico. Uh, we saw the grid entirely destroyed. We're still trying to recover from that. We also learned that our supply chains uh, during this event were highly vulnerable. Puerto Rico had been responsible for manufacturing a uh, number of medical supplies and that was difficult when they were no longer in operation. And of course, this is a picture of California being scorched. Uh, and 2017 and 2018, we saw fires that like we've never seen in recorded history. Uh, the fires burn hotter, bigger, and they also have uh, to some extent, uh, their own climate, so that the embers fall, travel far further than historically we've experienced. For firefighters, this is a uh, challenging situation since they have know how to fight wildland fires. That's fires that are happening in wild areas. They know how to fight urban fires, but fires that occur in the areas of the wildland urban interface, that's that area where um, people like to live right next to some grasslands or forests, or they like to live within those areas. Uh, those fires are very difficult to control. Unfortunately, that is the fastest growing form of land use in the United States. Just take California. California currently has um, 
over uh, uh, 4.5 million units in this wildland urban interface at risk of fire with 11 million people. That's about a third of its population located in those areas. So as we've heard, uh, there's something happening here. Uh, it's uh, basically that uh, since uh, certainly the Industrial Revolution, humans have been greatly contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. Those are forming um, basically, and, and uh, Sarah will probably be alarmed, but I think of it as a blanket around the globe that traps uh, heat and we are definitively heating up. And that is based on observational data. We know that we are uh, heating up. So this is what, uh, when we st first started taking observational data around the, the 1880s, this is uh, a picture of how the hotspots across the globe. And now I'll take you to uh, 2019, uh, and you'll see a lot of the heating is ha happening in the Arctic. Ha that area is warming at least twice as fast. Very significant because as we lose the Arctic Ocean, not lose it, but we lose the covering to it, um, uh, the ice that covers it, it increases the heat because the heat gets absorbed by the black, now blackened surface, uh, whereas it used to be reflected uh, up through the ice and the white surface. Uh, this heat uh, is continuing. 2019 was the second hottest year uh, ever recorded. 2020 is predicted to be a hot year as well. Most of our uh, extreme heat years or the hottest years have occurred since 2000. We are just, the rate of heating is accelerating. And as you've heard from Sarah, this is a causing sea level rise uh, across the globe. One thing that's important to keep in mind is that sea level rise is not like a bathtub. Once you, uh, certain areas will be at worse risk than others. Uh, our Norfolk area, where most of our, many of our military assets are located, the largest uh, naval port in the world, that area is particularly vulnerable to sea level rise. Uh, and uh, we will see uh, along the Atlantic coast, many areas losing significant amounts of land, including Florida. This is a picture of the prediction of sea level rise by uh, 2100. You'll see the darkened areas are where 50% of uh, the population will be displaced in those areas by 2100 by sea level rise. We actually have just had a study come out recently that even a modest amount of sea level rise with that storm surge, that big wall of water, causes much more inundation than we previously understood. So uh, there will be people living in very soggy conditions a lot faster. And to date, our real estate markets really haven't responded. We are continuing to build in very high risk areas in some places in the Northeast, for example, Connecticut and New Jersey, we have been building at a higher rate in high risk areas at, for flooding than in low risk areas. So we know, as Sarah has said, we are facing much more extremes uh, in the West. We, and actually all over, we also suffer them in the Southeast and the South and in the Northeast, much more severe droughts. Some of these droughts are of uh, historical proportions. Certainly California has suffered that uh, recently, and that has very big implications uh, for wildfire as well, uh, simply because the soil is so dry and the vegetation becomes just so um, very dry itself and subject to flame uh, uh, being <laughs> ignited. Uh, you've heard, uh, we don't know how many, but we know that the storms that will occur uh, because of the greater heat uh, will in all likelihood be more intense. And that's why we've, it's believed the scientists that uh, storms like Harvey, Sandy have been worsened by climate change. One thing that would be of interest to lawyers is the forensic sci science has gotten much better in recent years. It used to be that we could never tie a particular event to climate change. Now the forensic scientists can tell us that particular event was worsened by a range of 25 to 29%, for example, as a result of warming temperatures and climate change. The bigger wildfires we've talked about, uh, this picture uh, in Los Angeles, it is a really caught us by surprise. If you talk about global economic uh, risk, when we don't have a power system that is resilient to wildfires, we have had to take the crude measures that PG&E has had done where they entirely cut off power to certain areas of California, which is uh, the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. 
uh, we need to find better ways to build resilience. And then you've heard about the extreme heat. Uh, this is a uh, er area where we are seeing much more extreme heat events and they are killer events. Uh, and we do not have the kind of cooling shelters, uh, heat plans, uh, and other measures like white roofs in place to reduce heat, particularly in urban heat islands. We're finding that those uh, can really trap the elderly and the most vulnerable in terrible situations. So, uh, of course, the verdict is we need to, to build real resilience now. Uh, and the most fundamental thing I would ask any of you to keep in mind is that stationarity is dead. Human civilization has enjoyed for about eight to 10,000 years very, a very stable climate. That's allowed human civilization to flourish. It's allowed us to urbanize. It's allowed us to um, become much more organized than ever before. But now that period of a stable climate is changing. The boundaries are moving and we are facing more extremes. Unfortunately, we are not yet systematically planning for those extremes. This is a picture of an atoll in the Marshall Islands uh, called Kwajalein. It's an important military asset for the United States. Uh, we have, uh, we do um, uh, tests for uh, ballistic missiles from this site, but we also just recently spent a billion dollars, close to a billion dollars on building a new radar system. And the radar system is designed to detect space junk. That's the, the stuff that gets left up in space that might run into some of our new um, new satellites that we're launching. So it's very important that we detect those and move the satellites away. When this project started in uh, 2013, uh, the vulnerability assessment concluded that uh, the project was not at risk of uh, inundation based on historical records. Well, you can look at that picture and you can tell if there's sea level rise, there's a risk. So what's happened now is that we've learned uh, that you cannot plan based on historical risk. Now it's clear that within 20 years, this uh, island of uh, 25 years faces severe inundation going forward. We also, uh, as it turns out, uh, after Katrina chose not to invest in higher levees to protect the city at extreme expense to us all going forward. What can we do? We need to do risk assessments. Uh, there, that is the primary thing. You're hearing about the modeling occurring at NOAA. Every region needs to understand its risks. We need to have much better data and make it in an understandable form. This is a form of showing the maximum temperatures on the rise, the same information that you've seen from Sarah in a different format. We need early warning systems so that people can know what's gonna happen. And as she's mentioned, better predictive capabilities for weather. Uh, we can only predict weather out now, about two weeks. Uh, imagine if we could predict it out to a year or more so that we could preposition supplies so we could be ready and have communities survive much more uh, better. We need better land use. This is a picture of Tahoe Ranch where we saw uh, wildfires that uh, in 2017 and 2018, in 2019, Los Angeles County approved a 19,000 home development here, even though it was determined to be at high risk. We need better, stronger building codes requiring elevation and then when it get, the water gets too near to move away. We need flood protection. This is Texas Anderson's uh, during Harvey. They had invested in flood protection, 50 uh, different buildings, a square, a uh, couple of square mile facility. They were remained completely operational during Harvey because they had invested. Similarly, Getty Museum in Los Angeles remained completely operational, didn't have to move any art during wildfires. And we know we need to get people out of these soggy areas. So there are new ideas for how do we can live. Uh, this is from the UN. It's a proposal for what we can do. So the question for all of you is what will we do? And I'll leave it with that with Ben Franklin. Right now, uh, by failing to prepare, we are preparing to fail. All of us, and I can't urge you more on this day, Earth Day, to get busy and engaged on this. It's coming, it's already here, but it will get a lot worse, a lot more quickly. 
just like with a pandemic, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, and we know enough now to know we need to act. So thank you so much. Uh, and I'm really glad I had a chance to join you and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Alice. Well, um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I hope we do uh, learn our lesson from, uh, from the pandemic and uh, you've really given us a tangible sense of how fragile we are. And uh, I hope that, uh, that somehow uh, uh, focus will be, uh, will be brought to bear on this problem and the money will, the immense amounts of money that are gonna be needed in order to prepare our coasts and um, our built environment and our natural environment are somehow gonna be found. Next up uh, is uh, Tommy Vest, who is uh, the general counsel of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. And Tommy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, Everyone getting that? Okay. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. Um, so first and foremost, thank you for having me. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm a uh, general counsel at the mayor's office in New York City for um, the mayor's office of resiliency. Um, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity to come speak about resiliency efforts in the city. Um, I wanna take some time to uh, set the stage here and give you a little bit of context into um, the New York City specific issues. Um, with 520 miles of coastline and a de densely populated urban environment, New York City is um, particularly susceptible to the impacts of climate change. So, um, you know, all of those impacts that Alice and Sarah mentioned are kind of magnified here in um, New York City. So, as Alice went to in depth, uh, Hurricane Sandy in 2012 really put um, a spotlight on climate change and it served as a wake up call um, for New York City in addition to the federal government. Um, it emphasized our vulnerability to coastal storms and to a certain extent sea level rise. Um, but here in the mayor's office, we recognize that we need to take a multi-hazard approach to climate change and that New York City's climate risks really extend beyond just our coastline. So um, I, I'm not gonna spend too much time focusing on these numbers. I think we got a, a bit of that in the last couple of presentations, but um, I, I do wanna take just a minute to talk a little bit about um, uh, temperature and the danger of um, extreme heat. So extreme heat's actually the deadliest natural hazard in New York City um, and uh, coastal storms and sea level rise tend to get a lot of attention here, but heat is a real killer. And these are preventable deaths that impact really our most vulnerable citizens. The elderly, low income folks are those that are least able to um, uh, address and deal with this. Um, and so climate change is not just the, the physical impacts, but these, these hazards, these physical hazards have cascading impacts. Um, and in New York City, we have to consider the impacts to our citizens, our communities, our businesses, as well as the city's own um, operations and assets. Um, does the Department of Tran Transportation, do they, should they go about demapping streets that are continuously getting flooded? Do we implement road elevations across the city. Um, you know, Alice mentioned after Hurricane Sandy that the interdependencies between all of these things, no one can be an island, but there's a lot of roadways in New York City. And so how do we um, ad adapt and address all of these issues? Um, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is gonna have to start thinking about the increased political stresses from climate migration. Um, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene also needs to, um, is working on um, addressing mental health issues due to degrading environments. Um, and these aren't just problems uh, that we are in the future, but it's really issues that New York City is dealing with today. Um, so how is 
organizationally, how is New York City addressing this? It's really a two-pronged approach. We have the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, which is focused on um, the climate, the climate or carbon mitigation side of the climate change coin. So they're the ones who are um, focused on implementing the 2050 carbon neutral goals um, and really can generally uh, uh, reducing the city's in, uh, contributions to climate change. Um, but an MOR, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, as I'll go into uh, detail, detail later on, is, is focused on adapting the city's the city to the climate change that these are the changes in the climate that we estimate are already really kind of baked in. Um, I also want to take an opportunity to show you a few of the other agencies that we work with. Um, there's the uh, uh, Mayor's Office of Climate Policy and Pro Programs. They deliver One NYC, which is the city's um, strategic plan. Um, it's it's refreshed every four years. Um, there's annual updates, um, but it's broader than just climate. Um, climate, obviously, planning plays a big role in that document, but it, it's not the sole focus. Um, they also are focused on uh, divesting the city's pension from funds um, from fossil fuels, which is an important effort, um, and facilitating the global uh, network of relationships. We also have the New York City um, uh, Emergency Management they're um, really kind of focused on planning and communicating for um, event-based um, risks. So, you know, heat waves, coastal storms, um, and then they're also tasked with the um, spearheading the hazard mitigation plan for the city. Um, additionally, they work as, um, they work closely with FEMA and state on uh, mitigation grant funding. So uh, there's a lot of collaboration there. We also have the um, Mayor's Office for um, Housing uh, Recovery. They were um, established right after Hurricane Sandy and kind of focused on uh, build it, the Build It Back program and implementing them that. So now that I've told you a bit about our, our partner agencies, let me uh, delve into what MOR is doing um, and, and the work that we focus on. We like to organize our um, as we lay out in 1NYC, we organize our work into these four categories. Um, we mitigate physical risks. Um, so that those are those physical projects to mitigate climate change impacts. Uh, we are also focused on empowering residents and businesses. And this is really about getting New Yorkers the tools they need to ensure that they can uh, weather the storm, pardon the pun. Uh, we <laughs> also uh, work to build a climate ready government. And this is kind of the bread and butter of um, what you would expect government agencies to do, putting in place policies, um, regulatory schemes, and uh, governance structures necessary for resilience. And then finally, we are also focused on advancing and applying climate science. Um, this, of course, marks the foundation of our work. Um, so I'm going to go into each of these areas a little bit more in depth. I'm going to take them out of order, though. I want to start with climate science, really because it is the foundation of our work. Um, so here we have, um, here's a, a picture of the heat vulnerability index um, that was developed uh, for New York City that we developed for, for New York City, uh, showing kind of the risks um, that uh, particular areas of the city um, have to heat. Um, and then on top of that, there's a layer showing where New York City cool roof projects are. Um, and so you can see we're able to target those areas um, that need intervention because of the, the studies and the research that we've done in, with um, heat vulnerability. Um, a few of the things that we're working on, some highlights, uh, we've installed indoor-outdoor temperature monitoring network. Um, we've used, we're using LIDAR data to create um, precise citywide elevation maps. Um, we're, doing, we're working on studies um, to look at an intense rainfall um, and wind and how that impacts uh, city buildings and assets. And then we're also, um, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, developing a, a first of its kind future flood risk map. Um, so what I didn't mention in the climate science part 
um, but really is the kind of crown jewel of our, our climate work here is um, that of the New York City Panel on Climate Change. So this is um, was established in our in our New York City Charter as um, an advisory panel. Um, uh, it's appointed by the mayor, composed of climate scientists that really advise our office and the mayor's office of sustainability on uh, New York City specific risks, um, and uh, they inform projections for New York City. Um, they issue reports approximately every three years. Um, the, the most recent one was in 2019. Um, some of the highlights from that report are um, the uh, temperature and precipitations um, that we've experienced over the last few years are in line with their previous projections for 2020, so essentially validating um, the modeling that they've been using. Um, they've also developed, a, for, for this report, a new um, sea level rise scenario, um, which is the Ar Antarctic rapid ice melt scenario for the 2080s and 2100s. It's a low probability um, uh, scenario, but very scary. Um, and then they've also developed new maps uh, that show monthly uh, tidal flooding. We're actually in the process of appointing um, a, a new panel um, which is really exciting for us and we're um, kicking off the work for the next MPCC, MPCC4. Um, uh, another area of um, climate science that uh, we focus on is the um, FEMA flood insurance rate maps. Um, New York City successfully appealed um, the FEMA's maps in 2015. Uh, let me just, just take a step back here and give you a little bit more information. So FEMA's flood maps are developed as part of the National Flood Insurance Program and the flood insurance rate maps or firms, as their name implies, are, are used to determine um, flood insurance requirements for federally backed mortgages and other federal programs. Um, and these firms are also used uh, to determine applicable standards in the building code. Um, the current effective firms from 2007 are really um, outdated topical weather data from 1983. They're referred to as the 2007 maps because they were digitized in 2007, but they actually include data from 1983. So um, uh, FEMA was actually in the process of updating these flood maps when Sandy hit. Um, and in 2015, they um, issued uh, preliminary flood insurance rate maps. New York City, in evaluating those um, preliminary maps, um, decided to appeal um, and challenge a couple of uh, two aspects of um, FEMA's storm surge analysis. Um, and we actually won that appeal. It was reviewed by an independent review board um, that sided with the city. And as such, um, MOR is now working with FEMA to create two new map products. So, um, these are both expected to um, come out in the next three to four years. One is um, revising the current risk um, and that um, informs insurance. Um, but we're also working with FEMA to create um, future conditions that will um, reflect impacts of um, future sea level rise. And this will be used to inform our building code and land use. Um, this here uh, is a map of the city's, um, uh, or, or the current, so the 2007 firms, oops, sorry, the 2007 firms, 2013 firms, and the projected 2050s. And you can see um, the number of residents living in the floodplain and the number of jobs, buildings, and, and homes is really kind of expected to increase quite dramatically for the city. Um, so the next area, next bucket of kind of work that we do is empowering residents and businesses. Um, I think flood insurance is an excellent, excellent segue into that topic because it's really um, an avenue by which individual citizens can help prepare for, um, clim for the impacts of climate change um, and a step that they can take. Um, the the city is also looking into tools and resources that we can provide to make it easier for residents and businesses um, to help themselves. So, uh, the city's provided seven and a half million um, uh, in, uh, to uh, small businesses for emergency preparedness. We've increased flood insurance enrollments. 
Um, we've launched a program um, called Be a Buddy, which um, is really aimed at addressing um, heat vulnerability. Um, and generally, we're recognizing that community-based and faith-based organizations are the entities that are going to be there when um, trouble hits. And so th to the extent to which we're, we can help coordinate with those groups, um, the better off we'll be. Um, the other aspect of our climate change work involves um, building a climate ready government. So um, again, this is the policy regulatory and government reforms um, to, that we need in place for resilience action. So uh, after Hurricane Sandy, the city was able to secure over $15 billion in state and federal funding, um, which has kind of allowed us to, to um, do a lot of the really interesting work that we've been able to do in the last five years. Um, where we've also updated the building code to require more flood resistant standards, um, updated zoning to limit density in areas of chronic flood risk. Um, and then one of the things that our office has worked on um, is the climate resilience design guidelines. So th this is a, a tool for um, engineers and architects um, that want to take climate change into account in building um, infrastructure and buildings. So um, this is uh, kind of above and beyond building code standards. Um, um, and then finally, the, the last area, which I think kind of garners the most attention, are these physical product, uh, projects to um, promote resiliency and uh, eliminate or reduce climate impacts. Um, I have a list here of some of our uh, kind of high profile uh, projects. We have the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Study, Eastside Coastal, or um, sorry, Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency, Eastside Coastal Resiliency, the Army Corps um, Staten Island Project, um, the Red Hook Integrated Flood Protection System, Staten Island Blue Belts, um, Ray Shorelines, which are really kind of happening citywide, um, the Army Corps Project in the Rockaways, um, the Breezy Point Hazard Mitigation Program Project, uh, Hunts Point, and then we also have implemented interim flood protection measures, which are kind of um, a combination of just in time, so uh, uh, sandbags, that type of thing, um, that are considered temporary while the city um, figures out more permanent ways to protect these assets. Um, so going a little bit more into uh, one of our marquee projects, um, Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency is, I, I think, uh, many in this group may have heard of the Big U, uh, which got a lot of attention after Hurricane Sandy as a, um, a way of protecting Lower Manhattan. That's kind of morphed over the years into um, a collective of different projects um, outlined here in this map that you can see. On the um, northern eastern side, you have East Side Coastal Resilience Project, which I'll get into a little bit on the next slide. Um, but you also have the um, Brooklyn Bridge um, Montgomery Coastal Resilience Project, formerly known as Two Bridges. Um, below that, you have the, uh, the Financial District and Seaport um, Climate Resilience Master Plan, which is considering um, the option of outboard development to protect this very um, densely populated, or uh, sorry, uh, densely constructed neighborhood. Um, and then here on the, the southern end and the western side, you have um, the Battery Park um, projects which are um, being implemented by the Battery Park City Authority. Um, and then finally, I wanted to just take a second to talk a little bit about the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. Um, this project is um, almost one and a half billion dollars um, and it's 2.4 miles long, but it's also going to protect 110,000 people um, from both storm surge and sea level rise. Um, this is an incredibly densely, um, densely populated neighborhood. It also, or neighborhoods, um, it also has a very high proportion of low income housing. Um, there's uh, several NYCHA campuses here in this area. Um, and uh, the way the city's implementing this project is it's actually going to, um, for a large stretch of it, it's going to elevate uh, East River Park, which is located here on the border. Um, uh, on the on the, the coastline, um, approximately eight feet. Um, it also at the same time is going to improve waterfront access and park amenities. 
um, this project should be, uh, the flood protection should be in place by 2023 and um, completion by 2025. The, the um, genesis of this project really kind of came from that um, big U idea and the city did receive um, HUD funding to the tune of uh, $338 million for this project, but, um, you know, it's still requiring an, over a billion dollars in city capital um, investment. So, um, you know, these big projects uh, are, have big tickets, uh, big ticket price tags. And so the city needs to think about, especially going forward, um, whether, you know, hard protections like these are, are it's, it's simply not possible across the 520 miles of coastline. So how are we going to um, address this in, in, every, in every neighborhood? Um, so, so that's it um, for my presentation, but I look forward to your questions and um, thanks for having me. Uh, thank you, Tommy. Um, you know, I said at the beginning of the, uh, of the conference that uh, the state and city of New York have uh, not been spinning their wheels. And I think you've given us a really good sense of uh, just uh, how true that is. Um, thank you. So ne next up will be uh, Anel Hernandez, who is Associate Director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. I'm going to turn it over to you, Anel. Hi, good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen. Great. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anel Hernandez, and I'm the Associate Director with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. And we are an organization founded in 1991, and we are a network of grassroots community-based organizations across New York City um, that represent and serve low-income communities and communities of colors across the city. Um, for decades and longer, these communities have been overburdened by a variety of environmental injustices um, from pollution and siting of noxious industrial areas and other environmental burdens. And all of this is now being compounded by climate vulnerabilities. And here you see a map of all of our member organizations that some of you may be familiar with. And we work really closely with them um, on citywide policies, on statewide policies, but also on neighborhood level priorities and neighbor neighborhood level projects. Um, just yesterday, actually, we released our New York City Climate Justice Agenda 2020 that focuses on three major areas of work. Um, reducing greenhouse gases and localized emissions, advancing a just transition towards an inclusive and regenerative economy, and cultivating healthy and resilient communities, um, which touches upon across, across a, a wide variety of sectors, transportation, waste, energy, and of course, um, resiliency and nature-based solutions. Um, in this report, we also, um, analyze the connections between environmental justice and the current um, COVID-19 pandemic and how existing vulnerabilities has made um, COVID-19 impact low-income communities and communities of color first and worst, um, which is you know, really challenging and is yet another compounding issues impacting these communities. And so um, for a long time, one of the ways that we've been approaching um, coastal resiliency is by looking at our industrial waterfronts. Um, so in New York City, there are areas that are significant maritime and industrial areas where all of our um, noxious uses and, and other um, polluting industries are concentrated in. And these areas are predominantly people of color and low income people. And we found that all of these areas are particularly vulnerable to coastal flooding and storm surge. 
And this is increasingly worrisome, as, as previous panelists have mentioned, um, the NPCC 2019 reports projections continue to demonstrate um, increasing sea level rise, um, tidal patterns, flooding, and storm surge will, will just continue to increase vulnerabilities in New York City. And even um, the projections that were referenced earlier that include the Arctic ice melting, those numbers continue to skyrocket, which is really concerning. And so through our Waterfront Justice Project, we've been specifically assessing the climate change impacts on the industrial water funds and supporting community-based research and actions that help reduce these environmental risks, particularly in Sunset Park and in the South Bronx, where we've been looking at um, auto shops and other like um, major oil storage facilities that could become uh, displaced during a storm surge event and result in toxic exposure. Um, so that's something that we're really concerned around and we've been advocating um, for resilient industry strategies with the Department of City Planning to make sure that uh, we don't have another public health emergency on top of a climate emergency. And we've seen in, in Houston, for example, with Hurricane Harvey, that there was a lot of um, toxic exposure from the industrial areas. So making sure that the industries are resilient is really important. Um, and I will add that a lot of these areas are also under pressure uh, from gentrification um, to change the land use from industrial to, to commercial or residential. Um, but we're also very concerned with that because it's important that we maintain our industrial waterfronts to help be the engine for transitioning into renewable energy, transitioning into just uh, more climate adaptation industries. Um, so we really want to make sure that these waterfront industrial areas are maintained and become the future of our transition. And here we have uh, created an interactive map that shows storm surge, it shows sea level rise, um, and a variety of other um, climate and health risks, along with the uh, location of bulk storage facilities. Um, across the significant maritime and industrial areas. And here we're, we're zoomed into Newtown Creek, which is located between Brooklyn and Queens. And as you can see, there's a lot of, um, a lot of industrial uses concentrated there that have the potential to be displaced. And so we wanna make sure that, that government, businesses and communities are working together to make sure that we are um, as, as ready as we can be for any other um, climate event or emergency. And in addition to the industrial uh, waterfront, there are a lot of other areas across the city that we need to make sure that we are protecting, um, including, as I mentioned, Newtown Creek, which is also, which is also a super fun site, um, which just highlights the, the importance of making sure that we're building coastal resiliency along those areas. Hunts Point, of course, which is home to the Food Distribution Center. East Harlem, um, which uh, hasn't, uh, East Harlem, North Brooklyn, and Sunset Park, um, neither of those communities have, has gotten um, funds to build uh, coastal resiliency efforts in their communities. There's been some studies, um, but nothing yet concrete. And so we really want to make sure that we're seeing these climate adaptation strategies uh, happen more quickly. Um, and, and generally across all of these areas, Nija is recommending that we're incorporating nature-based infrastructure and shoreline interventions as much as possible as an equitable solution to deal with these climate vulnerabilities, but also address other negative public health outcomes. Um, and for example, um, as many of you know, the Army Corps of Engineers had their New York, New Jersey Harbor um, tri and tributary study that was looking at the different options for coastal protection in New York City. One of the main options was uh, the seawall proposal, the 119 billion seawall proposal. And we were really concerned with that sort of great infrastructure, you know, one strategy approach. Um, and so we, we continued to advocate for the more uh, shoreline based options that they had in that study. And then we were all very surprised to see that the entire project was defunded, which is really concerning. Um, we, we hope that 
that funding stream opens up again because we're going to really need a lot of money to to make New York City more resilient. Um, and generally, you know, I just wanted to say that. Um, oops, sorry. Um, coastal resiliency benefits should should really benefit New Yorkers not just on the day of the emergency, but every every day of the year. Um, and that's something that's, that's really important to us. We need to make sure that we're maximizing the, the numerous co-benefits of green infrastructure. And so I just wanted to, to talk quickly about um, what, you know, what we see as the benefits of green infrastructure. Of course, we need ecologically grounded coastal protection and resiliency investments. We need to advance all sorts of nature-based solutions in, in EJ communities, including um, stormwater management, um, which of course is very connected to the coastal resiliency efforts. You know, every, every time it rains in New York City, raw sewage flows into our waterways, and that you know, increases the risks that are present during a storm surge or flooding event. So we need to make sure that we're, we're approaching those two things in tandem. Um, we need to really increase street tree investments, community gardens, bioswales, open spaces, and, and parks. Um, and all of that will result in improving the quality of our waterways, mitigating urban heat island effect, improving air quality, reducing energy demand, helping foster a community cohesion, and uh, creating a local workforce, um, creating local workforce development opportunities. I think all of these types of green infrastructure investments can really help um, catalyze an industry related to that here in New York City. Um, and here on the side, we have a report that we worked on with Earth Economics, where we took a deep dive into Hunts Point in the South Bronx to see, you know, what all these nature-based investments would result in and how beneficial it would be to the community. And um, as was previously mentioned, Hunts Point Resiliency was one of the projects that was funded by the US, um, uh, US HUD um, through their CDBGDR funding stream after Hurricane Sandy. Um, and along with our member organization, the Point CDC, we were very involved in the Hunts Point Resiliency project. Um, we were key stakeholders from, from the beginning to the end, almost a five year um, effort. And here we have um, two, two things that were shared by the New York City Economic Development Corporation that helped manage this process. You know, the first one is a map showing what the vulnerabilities are in, Hun in the Hunts Point Peninsula, what the, the critical systems and vulnerable facilities are in the peninsula. Um, and, and for those that are not familiar, Hunts Point is home to the Food Distribution Center, which is the major, the major source of food for the region. Um, and so when we talk about community resiliency and, and resiliency for New York City as a whole, protecting the food distribution center is, is a major priority. Um, however, uh, the funding that was received was really not enough um, to get us to, to the visions that the community had. Um, the, the CDBGDR funding went to both energy resiliency and coastal resiliency. Um, and so through the energy resiliency piece of it, we were able to get um, some more projects for the food distribution center, as well as some solar and storage projects for public schools in the community that can serve as emergency evacuation centers and have um, some short-term backup power. Um, but on the coastal resiliency side, uh, the the federal grant only provided for a feasibility study of the coastal protection. And, and here on the right, we have, you know, just one of the renderings of the options that were reviewed during that process. Um, but unfortunately, there was no uh, additional funding to realize those visions or, or to keep working on that. And that's, you know, really concerning for us. We, we want to see that prioritized, particularly because it is such a critical facility. Um, and we hope that any process uh, going forward led by, by you know, the city, state, or federal government really builds on the community engagement, on the um, community ideas and priorities that were elevated during this five-year process. 
Um, and of course, there's extreme heat. I think, um, as was mentioned earlier, oftentimes we, we talk about um, hurricanes um, first, but extreme heat is something that's going to impact New York City every single year. Um, and it's going to impact the most vulnerable New Yorkers um, more so. And here we have a map of the heat vulnerability index that um, was also referenced earlier, um, overlaid with the locations of NYCHA public housing developments. And, and you can see that over half of NYCHA residents live in the city's most vulnerable neighborhoods. Um, and we have been advocating for more heat mitigation strategies and for more community preparedness investments to, to help deal with this disproportionate burden. Um, we've been supporting the development of, of community level preparedness plans um, to address this. For example, again, with the Point CDC, we did um, emergency preparedness scenarios around heat waves and blackouts and, and hurricanes and flooding and how the community and businesses and organizations can respond at the local level. Um, and at a citywide level, we just really want to make sure that the New York City is accurately capturing the heat mortality data um, and seeing where the, these uh, heat deaths are happening and how we can um, better mitigate it. Um, we need to make the cooling center locations available prior to the actual extreme heat event so that the most vulnerable people, including the elderly that may not have access to, you know, the internet right when the heat emergency happens know where they need to go uh, during this event and we just generally are advocating for more dedicated funding streams for uh, extreme heat community preparedness um, and it's also important to say that given you know everything that's happening right now this issue is becoming even more concerning um, because of social distancing you know cooling centers are not going to be able to operate in the same way and how are we gonna make sure that we're providing um, emergency services to the most vulnerable? Um, and one of the key extreme heat mitigation strategies is um, street trees, green infrastructure supporting our urban forest. Um, as you know, trees have the ability to store, absorb carbon emissions that are driving the climate crisis, but also absorb harmful co-pollutants like particulate matter that affect respiratory health at the very local level. Um, trees provide cooling by mitigating the urban heat island effect through evo, evo transpiration and shading. Um, and we continue to urge that the city expand their cool neighborhoods, New York City street tree commitment, and renew the successful Million Trees NYC program um, to increase urban canopy coverage and ensure long-term maintenance and health of the city's forest. Um, and here on the right uh, is a report that we recently released with the Nature Conservancy, just taking a deep dive into the health and equity of New York City's urban forest. Um, so definitely uh, take a look at that. And here is a map uh, just overlaying um, canopy coverage by community district along with the heat vulnerability index. And you know, this highlights that some of the most heat vulnerable communities do not have enough tree canopy coverage, you know, whether that's in, in parks or street trees or backyards or, or other green spaces. Um, it's just not enough to deal with this increasing um, climate hazard. And just, you know, the last thing I'll say is that all of these different types of nature-based solutions, we have to approach it in an integrated way. We have to make sure that, you know, when we're building street trees to deal with heat, if we're uh, building um, bioswales or other green infrastructure to deal with storm water, if we're building, you know, shoreline resiliency and coastal protection, all of those things need to be planned in tandem with each other. I mean, here is just sort of a, a quick snapshot of different areas in New York City and the different ways that, that we use um, our green space and how that can help you know, build more resiliency in the community. Thanks very much, Anil. Okay, so now we're gonna switch over to uh, the question and answer portion of the, uh, of the, of the panel. Um, and I think, I think I'm going to start. I'm going to start with a question to, uh, to uh, Tommy and Anel. Um, I think the two of you have demonstrated just how uh, spectacular a job 
the city of New York has done in terms of its adaptation planning in general, and also um, uh, it has given a, a, a tremendous amount of thought to how to protect the disadvantaged community that's most at risk in uh, climate change. And you know the problems that New York City faces are bad, but they pale in comparison to the problems of cities around the world uh, and the risks posed to those communities in general and to the disadvantaged communities there uh, in particular. So my question is whether and how New York City can take the show on the road and uh, how it could share its knowledge and its best practices with other, uh, other communities around the world. You might not have an answer, but, uh, but if you don't have an answer, my, uh, my question to you is, is can you give that some, some thought? Because I think there's, uh, there's a great deal of knowledge that could be shared with the world. And I think, uh, and it would be wonderful if you could do that. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I mentioned the Office for Climate Policy and Programs, and they are um, uh, active in the international community um, and kind of spearhead the relationship building between New York City and um, other other municipalities and, and um, uh, government organizations around the world. Uh, we are members of um, 100 Resilient Cities, um, which is uh, an organization that really does try to bring um, cities together to collaborate on climate change issues. Um, and so I, I do think that we are mindful of that and we try to take up opportunities. Um, but generally speaking, we usually aren't the ones coordinating those, um, those type of uh, programming. It's really, we'll participate when invited to, um, when invited to speak or um, attend events that are organized usually by nonprofits or foundations um, and, and kind of collaborate in that way um, in those forums. But I think what you're mentioning is, is interesting and, and I agree, we, we do need to ensure that we're um, sharing our knowledge um, both within the US and internationally, but also um, learning from best practices wherever we can. Thank you. And I'll just add that I think um, from our perspective, we, it's really important that community-based organizations across different localities also connect with each other and share strategies. Um, so NIJA is part of the Climate Justice Alliance um, and there's various environmental justice communities um, and organizations in California, Texas, Florida um, that we've shared um, our research with and, and vice versa. And so. Um, at the government level, it's really important to make those connections, as, as Tommy alluded to, but also at the, the community-based level, it's also important to, to share um, information and experiences and research. Thank you. Nice to know. I have a question for Alice as well. Alice, that, um, that, uh, that uh, a map of the United States with the uh, inundation shown on the coast as of 2100, is the kind of thing that you wake up, that one, sh one should wake up screaming in the middle of the night looking at. And all I could think of, all, all I could think of is how much money it's going to cost to protect the coasts of the United States and, of course, the world. And, and so, you know, the, the federal government isn't going to write a check like it did with Sandy. It can't for every municipality on the coast. Uh, insurance companies are going to get tapped out. Um, the fossil fuel, a number of cities have uh, sued the fossil fuel industry and those lawsuits haven't gotten much uh, traction as yet. And so uh, my question is, how do you begin planning for coming up with the vast amounts of money that are going to be needed in order to begin to protect the coastline of the United States? Because the, the coastline that you showed cannot be the coastline of the United States in 2100. Um, the, the, I mentioned a, uh, a task force uh, report that the city bar put out a couple of, uh, couple of years ago, but which by the way is still online at uh, the city bar uh, website. And uh, they floated the idea of a micro tax being imposed on, uh, on stock trades and financial transactions. And Alice and any, any of the other panelists who might wanna share some, some ideas uh, if you could talk about where the money's going to come from, that would be great. Or whether, you know, the government is going to set up some sort of a committee or whatever to think through where the money's going to come from. 
Well, you uh, identified a huge problem. Uh, first, let me say that there is no way that we'll be able to harden or protect all of this coastline. There just isn't that kind of money in the coastline. Uh, like uh, Manhattan, so over 500 miles of coastline just uh, in the New York area, we can't protect it all with structures. So uh, there will be retreat. The term managed retreat has become uh, a, a dirty uh, word uh, in many communities as they're realizing that they will have to move back uh, from the lands that they've enjoyed for many years. Finding the money, first of all, is uh, we need to change how the federal government currently approaches disasters. Uh, we're seeing it uh, with the COVID pandemic uh, and obviously the federal government needs to step in, in my opinion, to help the economy, help all, uh, all citizens who are drastically suffering under this event. But it reflects what we've been doing really since World War II, and that is the federal government has increasingly become the insurer of last resort. Uh, it has gone from basically nothing in 1950. It left all disaster recovery to private entities, NGOs, the Red Cross. And now federal government covers 70 to 100% of these disaster recoveries. That's not sustainable on the long term. And particularly because we uh, have adopted that model, it's created a moral hazard. It means that communities, the local communities that are in charge of land use and building decisions, don't have to pay the bill when the bad thing happens. So they make choices that uh, in hindsight, uh, put them at greater risk. And until the federal government can insist on sound building practices and land use practices, we'll be in a terrible uh, situation where we're just pouring more and more money in to allow people to rebuild where they were before. Of course, there's uh, cities like New York who are beginning to lead on land use, but I don't think the land use issue has been solved anywhere to date. California has attempted to do it, uh, their Coastal Planning Commission, but there have been major um, Objections raised by particular communities, for example, Del Mar, where ironically Bill Gates just bought a home, I read, uh, one of the most affluent communities on the coast. Uh, the Coastal Commission uh, asked for a plan for managed retreat. The city said, we're not going to do it because the homeowners objected to the loss in their land value. So it's going to be very tense for a while. The most important thing I think that we can have is a federal policy says that we will not put any more taxpayer money into areas that are at known risk. If you want to invest there, that's up to you, but we're not going to bail you out after the event occurs. And then, of course, for those who are most vulnerable and already there, we need to find uh, ways to help them exit from those areas through buyouts or other means to help them get away. But we can't keep pouring new money into new development and then expect the federal government to pay for it. I do wanna just say that the New York Bar uh, report that you mentioned is a really an outstanding report. So uh, for anyone who's interested in the challenges ahead, I would recommend it. It, it, was, uh, it, it is stands above other reports and its accessibility and also the ideas it proposes. Thank you. Um, Thanks very much. I'd also add to that that in the private sector we're seeing with insurance companies that they're starting to increase insurance rates or not insure in certain regions. And so they've been some of the most sophisticated in their use of understanding climate risks and starting to implement it in policies and the way that they're insuring. And we're seeing that um, across the United States relating to different types of disasters. Um, so when our research comes out and the data comes out, um, some of the first people that we hear from are actually the insurance and reinsurance um, industries trying to figure out how to use that information, pricing their risk or um, getting out of certain markets based on increasing climate risks. Could, I, could I just add one thing on that? Uh, I think for the primary insurers, um, we may not see as much ability to help the situation because they still write their policies on an annual basis. And we're seeing in California with the wildfires that they just um, don't wanna write the insurance because it's too high a risk. And then we end up with a lot of uninsured people, which just increases the pressure on the federal government and the governments to be the insurer of last resort. Uh, and that's how we actually ended up with the flood insurance program. It was in the 60s. We had some terrible flooding events. Everybody said, oh, let's help out, which good intentions. But now that program is um, 
not fiscally sound at all, has lost billions upon billions of dollars, and we cannot still get to actuarially sound rate. That means we cannot charge the uh, insurance holder or the premium holder uh, the kind of premiums that we need to charge to reflect the true risk. And so that means the risk is being covered again by the federal taxpayers. And um, ultimately, this is not sustainable. We need to be able to move into have uh, situations where people understand that the choices they're making about where they live are uninsurable. And therefore, if they want to live there, they need to have the funds themselves to live there. They need to insure themselves, in other words. Yep. Thank you, Alice. Um, so uh, uh, questions have come in from uh, the audience. One has to do with the interplay between the COVID-19 emergency and, uh, and resiliency planning. And the, the, que the question, at, you know, boiling it down, is um, uh, yeah, I, there apparently will be competition between uh, funds needed to deal with uh, the pandemic and funds needed to deal with re resiliency. And, uh, and uh, so the question is, are uh, resilience planning issues being treated by government as even more urgent given the current pandemic or are they gonna take a back seat? So I'll jump in and answer to the extent I can for New York City. Um, I think a lot of the resilience funding that we're spending these days is either federal funding um, that's still um, in our coffers from Hurricane Sandy, or it's city capital dollars, um, which is based on um, bonds. And um, the funding that is being expended to um, uh, respond to the COVID-19 is um, expense dollars. So this is probably a little technical, but expense dollars are tax levy. Um, funding. And so um, there isn't a ton of overlap between our um, resilience budget and our um, uh, kind of COVID emergency response. That being said, um, you know, it was mentioned, um, and now mentioned earlier about cooling centers. And I think that's one area where um, the city and, and our office in particular is looking to find solutions because um, cooling centers, at least as um, we've used them in the past are not um, are, are not likely to be an option this summer because of um, social distancing requirements. And so we will need to find non-capital funds to um, either um, uh, set up additional cooling centers that uh, that would allow for social distancing within those um, centers or find um, home cooling uh, options for um, vulnerable populations. And that would not be uh, capitally eligible. So we would need to find expense dollars for that. So um, I, I think there are some very specific areas where there is competition, but I think as far as our major infrastructure projects go, as far as our major infrastructure projects, um, we're not seeing uh, immediate impacts to the budget for those projects based on COVID-19. Um, a, a number of questions go back to the COVID-19, uh, the, the interplay with COVID-19 and, uh, and whether uh, people see any um, silver lining to the COVID-19 crisis uh, in terms of uh, whether, whether that will prompt government or others to uh, uh, begin to think about adaptation to climate and helping to promote solutions to the climate, to the climate uh, crisis. And related to that, uh, people are, are wondering that if there is additional federal stimulus money available, uh, could we steer it towards uh, climate resilience? Turn it over to the panelists. I know the CARES Act did include um, additional funding for um, uh, home energy uh, uh, for the home energy, I'm forgetting the acronym, but HEAP, um, IHEAP, which will um, allow the states to spend money on cooling um, and cooling assistance. So um, I, I, we have started. We have started to see that in the um, the federal response. But um, I think one of the things that our office is hopeful for is that we'll actually see um, an infrastructure spending bill which um, may then allow us to tap into federal funds for additional infrastructure projects um, as part of an economic stimulus um, as a result of COVID. And I'll, you know, I'll jump in to say that I think 
you know, the, the current crisis has already begun to, to usher in some austerity policies that threaten our uh, collective ability to recover and become more resilient. But we, I, I don't think that we can accept that frame. Um, now more than ever, it becomes important to focus on these areas. You know, we're very disheartened by the fact that at the fe federal level, they're trying to roll back environmental regulations and environmental monitoring. That is a huge concern, I imagine, for, for everyone on this call today. Um, and then at the, at the local level, when we're thinking about recovery from what's current, currently happening, we can think about it as, as sort of a green stimulus. Think about it as a way to, to actualize a just recovery with investments in climate adaptation and climate mitigation. Um, we, we are concerned that we've already seen, for example, the city cut organic waste pickup um, because it, it's not a priority, but you know, we shouldn't be giving up on these major climate goals that we've laid out for ourselves. We have to try to continue to, to stick by them as much as possible. Question came in. Uh, people are thinking about the, uh, the fact that uh, funds are gonna be scarce. Does anybody have a, a thought about priority, like what is the most important thing that uh, that should be? What are the two most important things that should be done um, to protect New York City? Other well, than build, I will uh, I will say I think that uh, New York City is trying to get uh, accurate mapping. I think we need to get the modeling. Uh, to be a part of uh, any decision making going forward. Uh, and that includes um, uh, through our infrastructure construction. New York City has done a good job, but this is not uh, across the nation. We don't routinely consider these things. Uh, and for example, modeling in many states, we cannot use future models to determine insurance rates. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that, that the insurance commissioners uh, do not allow that to occur. Uh, in Florida, it does occur, but until we can find better ways to incorporate our under current understanding, and as that understanding improves, incorporate that new understanding in decision making, we are leaving ourselves vulnerable to just continuing to pour out huge amounts of money to rebuild in the same places, in the same ways, being even more vulnerable going forward. Uh, so I would say that is the most important concept, is that any decision going forward must consider the future risk uh, that is posed by climate change. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll we're- Can I jump to you quickly? Go ahead, uh, I have to be very careful how I say things. As a federal scientist, I can't be advocating for funds, but I will say that on, for what we know scientifically, very similar to Alice, we've shifted from understanding how the climate's changing and being able to project it broadly, how these things are changing, but we need to shift um, the science community and how we're delivering things, shift towards better understanding risks, the climate risks in a way that is useful for um, actually actionable decisions and risks that are understood in the coming years or seasons, years, decades, instead of something just at the end of the century. And so I think that's a major area that we're going to see a lot of developments in the coming years. There's many things in the pipeline that we're doing to try to address that. And I think it's really important that the science comes together with all the stakeholders and people like yourselves to make sure that we're doing that in a way that makes it the most useful to be able to make actionable decisions based on it. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, we're out of time, and uh, I want to thank these panelists. They've, you've, you've really done a wonderful job. I want to let people know that the detailed bios for each of the panelists are available in their materials. I'm sure you're going to want to take a look at them, given these presentations. So thanks very much to the panelists, and thanks to the listening audience, whoever you may be. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna take a quick break now, uh, but since most people are at home, I'm guessing that you've been able to jump up and get a tuna fish sandwich if you need one, but it's now um, almost 11. So at precisely 11.05, we will resume with, uh, with my talk. Um, 
So do stand up, take a couple deep breaths. If you happen to be anywhere near where I am in the Adirondacks, you can go out and walk in the snow for a few minutes. We've got a good four or five inches here. Um, but I understand it's spring in other places. Um, so uh, open the window, get some fresh air, uh, take a few minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and load my presentation now and uh, the second panel uh, can get ready. Thank you again to the first panel and Kevin, that was outstanding. So um, let me share my screen. It is. Hey there, it's Kevin. Uh, can I get a quick mic check from Michael, Greg, and New? Hi, this is Michael. Can you hear me all right? Perfect. Hey, this is Greg. Perfect, I can hear you. And this is Peter. Oh, hey, Peter. Perfect, thank you. I'm actually hey, Kevin, how's my volume? Oh, you're perfect. Hey there, Kate. Hey. Hi, can you hear me? Perfect, thank you very much. Hi guys, thanks for all being here. And Mike, thanks for your thoughts uh, last night. It's uh, making sense of these crazy charts. Sure. So just another minute or two, if you guys can uh, check out your screens or turn up your volume from the, so you can hear me in the kitchen as you make a tuna fish sandwich, we can get going again. Uh, if you can see my uh, presentation, I'm gonna do a whirlwind tour through uh, the last uh, IPCC uh, report. This one was put out in 2014. The next one is due shortly but um, it's, uh, in my opinion, essential reading. If you wanna be able to talk intelligently about climate change, you need to know what the facts are and there's no better body to get the facts from than the uh, scientists who have put together the IPCC report. The website is there for you. This is in your materials. It's free, it's online. It's quite long, but uh, if you just focus on the executive summary portion of it, uh, I think that's the way to go. So as uh, our group reassembles, uh, welcome back. Uh, this is a reminder that uh, we are celebrating 50 years of the uh, Rolling Stones lips and uh, tongue logo. For all of you expecting to talk about uh, Earth Day, uh, you've uh, 
been um, taken over by a Zoom bomber. Uh, just kidding. It's also the 50th anniversary of EPA and NISDAQ and some of our favorite laws, the Clean Air Act and NEPA, uh, both of which, uh, as Kevin said, are under some attack right now. Um, but 50 years of Earth Day. So uh, here we are um, in rather strange circumstances. So let's look at this uh, report. Uh, the executive summary um, is written for lay persons. Uh, it is written by scientists, but it is written uh, in a way that we can understand it. Um, policymakers being uh, government dummies like myself, uh, people who um, don't necessarily understand the science, but uh, can uh, read and understand what is uh, very clear in this report. Uh, scientists tend to uh, talk about theories, um, but here uh, we have, if you look at SPM1, Summary for Policymakers, Observe Changes in Their Causes. Uh, for the most part, the um, report talks in uh, qualitative terms, in terms of what is a high, medium, or low degree of confidence that the scientists have in what they're putting forth. But uh, let's just read this first one right off the bat. Uh, they say, human influence on the climate system is clear, and recent anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are the highest in history. Recent climate changes have had widespread impacts on human and natural systems. There is no qualitative statement here. This is a straight out fact. The scientists should be envisioned as standing on their chairs, uh, screaming at the top of their lungs in this instance and indeed at, through most of this report. Uh, there is then this uh, statement is followed by a great deal of text. Uh, everything is footnoted. You can drill down as deep as you want. You can get all the way down to the actual scientific reports if you want. It's a spectacular document. So I'm going to sprint through it and I'm just gonna pause on some of these charts and I'm gonna hope that I uh, pique your curiosity and you can come back and study them after this uh, event is done. But here is one widespread impacts attributed to climate change based on available scientific literature since the last assessment report. And if you look down in this corner here, you can see here's the qualitative uh, statements that I was talking about, very low to very high. And these are the observed impacts attributed to climate change. So uh, just starting with uh, Central and South America, I'll just do one as an example. You can see that this is a uh, bolded uh, symbol it, it, that signifies a major contribution of climate change as opposed to uh, these outlines which are minor contribution to change but just focusing on the majors and the high degree of confidence. We're talking about, I'm going to have to get close to my screen here, glaciers, snow, ice, uh, and other permafrost as well as rivers, lakes, floods, and droughts. Um, uh, here we've got uh, food production and impacts, major impacts on livelihoods, health, and other economics. All high degree of confidence and all major impacts from climate change. And this number down here, 1987, is not uh, the year. That is the number of scientific reports that these conclusions are based on. 1987 reports. Um, have gone into this, these conclusions. The uh, climate, these IPCC reports are written, written literally by thousands of scientists. They are a synthesis, synthesis of their uh, conclusions, um, and they tell you that they have a high degree of confidence in, uh, in this consensus. So going on to SPM2, future climate changes, risks, and impacts. Here's another of my favorite charts. This is um, regional key risks and potential for risk reduction. Again, the same sorts of physical systems, uh, biological systems, human and managed systems that are included. Uh, let's just look briefly. Uh, oh, and here they talk about the risk level from very low to medium to very high. This first bar is the present. The second one is the near term, 2030 to 2050. Then long term at two degrees Celsius which uh, the scientists uh, are telling us that we are likely to blow right by. And then four degrees, which um, 
thankfully we're not quite there yet. But uh, the bold is where we are, and then uh, the striping is a potential uh, for additional either risk reduction or what will happen if we continue at our current rates of emissions. So here, looking at North America, and we have uh, increased damages from wildfires, and we're talking about terrestrial ecosystems, uh, wildfire, and again, livelihood, health, and our economics. Uh, we can see that at present, we're already into the medium risk category, uh, near term, uh, the same, but then at two degrees, we're well into high degree of risk, and then at four, which we probably are not, the scientists aren't saying we're there yet, but we're somewhere between uh, two and four. So you can see that we're, very, we're getting into very high risk, which is uh, when we start talking about catastrophe. Uh, and uh, I'm not gonna get into catastrophe. This whole uh, talk that I'm giving is uh, an hour long, but I've reduced it to six minutes. Um, and catastrophe is another whole bit that we won't get into, but let's just say it's bad. We don't wanna be there. So um, that's the importance of decarbonization, which is where all this is headed from uh, my panel. SPM3, future pathways and adaptation, mitigation and sustainable development. Uh, this puts some meat on the bone. Uh, here we've got, uh, right now we're at about uh, 420 parts per million of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, the, these are some of the uh, representative uh, concentration pathways. There are four use in the reports. Right now, we are somewhere between 4.5 and 6. Uh, never mind if that doesn't make sense. What uh, is important to look at here is how we're going to need to decarbonize, reduce our emissions in order to stay uh, at 1.5 degrees above uh, industrial levels. Uh, that's not going to happen. We're already at 1 degree above pre-industrial levels. Uh, that was put in there at the request of Pacific Island nations uh, who said, if it's not too much trouble, we'd like 1.5 in there because anything above that and we are gone, we are history. And that is happening. Pacific Island nations are being flooded. There is virtually no, no chance that those nations are not going to be uh, covered by the sea. So right now we're trying to get to two degrees Celsius and hold greenhouse gas is at that level, that's not happening either. That's the goal of the Paris Accords. Even if every nation uh, meets their individual pledges, uh, which no nation is currently doing, uh, we're still not likely to stop at two. We're much more likely to get on to three. So let's look what has to happen if we are going to be at more unlikely, even if we meet these limits, we're going to be at more unlikely than likely. So by 2050, we have to be at 18 or 54% of our emissions in 2010. And by the uh, turn of the century, we have to be at minus seven to 72%. So minus seven would be not only zero net emissions, but sucking CO2 equivalents out of the atmosphere. At present, that technology does not exist at scale. So that, that is the challenge that we are facing. Uh, and even if we do that, it is still more unlikely than likely that we will be stopping at three degrees Celsius increase. So um, uh, I'll spare you my two cents. Uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, we have panelists here who can handle these uh, challenges. Um, and I'm going to introduce them now all together. Uh, so that we can move, as Kevin did, seamlessly from one to the next. Starting off will be Mike Gerard, Andrew Sabin, Professor of Professional Practice and Director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change and Law at Columbia, and author of The Legal Pathways to Deep Decarbonization in the United States. Peter Lehner will come next. He's the Managing Attorney at Earth Justice, uh, followed by Kate Carrera, Deputy Director, Environmental Advocates of New York. Uh, followed by Greg Hale, the senior advisor at NYSERDA, and in the power hitting fifth slot, Lou Daly, senior policy analyst and senior advisor, policy development at Demos. So, Michael, in your 20 minutes, would you please um, save the planet? <laughs> Thank you, Carl. So, if you could unshare your screen so that I can share mine. You got it. Okay. Give me one second here.
Okay, so what I'm going to do um, now is uh, first talk about, give an overview about the energy sector, and then I'll talk about New York's new very important climate law. So most of the greenhouse gases that are emitted in the United States come from the energy sector, about 80% uh, come from the energy sector, the rest from uh, agriculture and waste and uh, industrial processes. Uh, some of it comes from petroleum, some uh, uh, directly from uh, electricity and so forth. It mostly leads to carbon dioxide, but also uh, methane and nitrous oxide and some other pollutants. And looking at where the energy used in the United States comes from, uh, the largest single uh, source is petroleum. And of course, the great bulk of that goes to transportation. Natural gas, which is used for transportation and heating and cooling and um, uh, industrial processes. Uh, coal and nuclear, which are entirely, uh, almost entirely for electricity and uh, renewables. In terms of the trends uh, of where U.S. energy has come from, here we see uh, coal peaked and has been declining. Natural gas increased very uh, considerably. This is going back to 1950. Uh, here we have petroleum, which is still a, you know, the, the largest source of energy in the U.S. Uh, nuclear, which has been fairly flat uh, in recent years, and uh, renewables. Looking just at where the electricity comes from, again going back to 1950, again we have coal, natural gas greatly uh, increased, nuclear fairly uh, constant, um, uh, renewables have increased, and then used to be a fair amount of petroleum was burned for uh, uh, to make electricity, but we have almost none of that anymore. Just looking at the uh, renewables, uh, the largest uh, portion of renewables in the United States is from hydroelectric. Then we have biomass and geothermal. Uh, but what we've seen going since about 2000 is a tremendous increase in the amount of wind energy uh, that we have uh, to make electricity in the US. And more recently, uh, an increase in the amount of solar energy that is going to make electricity in the, in the US. So that's where we have been. Where do we need to go if we are going to uh, radically cut back on uh, greenhouse gas emissions? There are a number of scenarios out there, uh, but let me first show you again where things are now in one scenario for going forward. So where we have now, where we are now, the same kind of concepts we were talking about uh, just a minute ago, petroleum um, uh, going overwhelmingly to transport natural gas, coal, and uranium. One scenario for uh, the year 2050 uh, that involves um, uh, drastically cutting back on uh, greenhouse gas emissions involves also drastically cutting back on our use of petroleum, uh, an increase in, in, in biomass, uh, still uh, a, a great decline in natural gas use, um, still have some uh, nuclear uh, around then, still hydro, but a tremendous increase in wind and solar. And the wind and solar uh, uh, mostly make electricity, and that electricity becomes the principal source of energy for uh, automobiles. We transition over the next three decades away from uh, uh, petroleum-powered automobiles to electric-powered automobiles, and uh, much of the uh, space heating, the building heating, uh, goes to electricity. So this is a um, depiction of, of, of one scenario of how we get to where we need to go. In New York State, um, by far the largest source of greenhouse gases is transport. It's automobiles and trucks and buses and airplanes. Uh, the next is buildings, both residential and commercial buildings. Uh, next is electricity and then some from, uh, from waste from landfill uh, uh, generating methane and that kind of thing. 
refrigerants, hydrofluorocarbons, and agriculture. In order to address these sources of greenhouse gas emissions, last July, Governor Cuomo signed into law the New York Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which is one of the strongest climate change laws in the world. Here is the uh, signing ceremony. He invited former Vice President Gore um, and legislative leaders and, and state administrative uh, uh, leaders to the signing ceremony. The, um, the statute sets forth various uh, uh, reduction requirements. And I'm saying requirements and not just goals because they are written into the law to be legally enforceable. Uh, so um, the baseline is 1990 levels. We're about 8.5% below those 1990 levels now. We're kind of the most recent figures. By 2030, the legal requirement is we be 40% below 1990 levels. And by 2050, 85% below with a goal of 100% of, of net zero emissions. The electricity needs to be 70% from renewables by 2030. And by 2040, 100% from zero emissions, which would be renewables plus nuclear. The statute also has uh, numeric requirements for how much um, we need to have from particular sources. Uh, so we need six gigawatts of distributed solar. Um, just to put that in perspective, one good sized nuclear power plant is about one gigawatt. So we've got the equivalent of six nuclear power plants worth of distributed solar, kind of rooftop solar, three gigawatts of uh, energy storage capacity up from very, very little and nine gigawatts of offshore wind. Right now we have zero. In terms of just specifically the electricity right now, 39% of our electricity comes from uh, fossil sources, uh, almost entirely natural gas. The, the sole remaining uh, coal-fired power plant in New York just closed down. 32% from nuclear, but that's about to drop considerably because the Indian Point nuclear power plants are closing in the, in the next uh, year or so. We still have four smaller nuclear power plants uh, up on Lake Ontario. 23% from hydro and 6% from non-hydro renewables. That's the wind and the solar. So not a lot of our electricity so far comes from wind and solar. By 2030, under the new law, uh, in order to have uh, a 70%, we have 70% renewable requirement, but right now we only have the 23% hydro and 6% non-hydro, so it has to go from 29% to 70%. And by 2040, it has to go up to 100% zero power, so that's the uh, hydro and solar and wind and nuclear. The statute um, sets forth a process for how to uh, do all of this and how to make the decisions that need to be made. And um, some of the job is done by the, um, the Climate Action Council and some by state agencies. The, so the Climate Action Council is a group of 22 people. 12 of them are um, uh, commissioners of New York state agencies. Uh, the rest are appointed by the governor and by the leaders of the legislature. Uh, so that council has been formed. Uh, it has the job of creating at least half a dozen advisory uh, uh, boards, advisory working groups that will focus on particular subject matter areas. And it then has the job of uh, drafting the plan. It's called the scoping plan, uh, the plan for achieving all of these objectives. It has uh, two years to do that. The deadline for uh, submission of its draft plan is January 1, 2022. While all of that is happening, um, state agencies uh, are at work. So the Department of Environmental Conservation has under uh, has started a rulemaking process to come up with the uh, greenhouse gas emission goals, the numbers for uh, that need to be achieved, and also to come up with a social cost of carbon to be used in in, in New York State. So that is underway, and that's uh, due in 2021. Uh, the Public Service Commission 
um, uh, needs to come up with a uh, plan to achieve the electricity goals. Um, in 2022, after this draft scoping plan is, um, um, is, is released, there will be public hearings on it um, and all kinds of public consultations. And the uh, final scoping plan is due January 1, 2023. And then uh, DEC has the task under the statute of um, issuing regulations to enforce, um, uh, to, to carry out the scoping plan. Uh, meanwhile, the Public Service Commission will already have uh, issued the, um, uh, you know, the plan, the, the binding requirements to meet the electricity goals. Now, all of this is very ambitious, and it uh, meets a number of uh, challenges, uh, uh, a number of which the other speakers will talk about in more detail. So the nuclear will be almost gone. As I said, Indian Point is about to shut down. The four remaining nuclear power plants upstate are all getting uh, really old by 2040. They will be uh, uh, even older. They'll have uh, uh, three of the four will have already been around for more than 60 years. We don't know how long they'll last. Nobody is currently uh, proposing any new nuclear power plants in New York. The economics of that are impossible. So the nuclear power has to be replaced by uh, renewable energy. As I showed, the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions in New York State is transportation, mostly from automobiles. But under the uh, under federal law, there's federal preemption of the greenhouse gas emission standards and fuel economy standards for automobiles. And the Trump administration is trying to weaken those standards from what the standards were set under the Obama administration. That is being challenged in court. We don't know how that'll turn out. If, uh, if President Trump is not reelected uh, and if Joseph Biden becomes the president, uh, he will almost certainly undo that and restore the Obama standards and, and, and then strengthen them going forward. But if that doesn't happen, if Trump is reelected and if his rollbacks survive the judicial challenges, that's going to make it much tougher for New York to meet these emission reduction uh, goals. Uh, we're going to need to phase out gasoline powered uh, 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 vehicles. Uh, people are not gonna have to scrap the, the cars they have, but in the years to come, their new cars uh, need to be uh, electric cars and um, uh, heavy duty vehicles, trucks and buses, uh, will either have to become electric, but that's harder for the larger trucks, or um, other technologies are being devised to uh, greatly lower their uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And at the same time, the state is going to have to uh, be building out at an even faster, faster pace the vehicle emissions, uh, the, the, the electric vehicle charging infrastructure, so that people will be able to fill their car batteries with electricity. Uh, uh, existing buildings uh, will have to be retrofit uh, so that their um, fossil fuel consumption goes way down and that will, for many of them, require conversion to electric heat. Uh, in New York City, um, uh, last year the City Council adopted an important law, Local, local Law 97, uh, that we'll be hearing more about uh, a little later. Converting much transport to electricity and uh, converting a much building heating to electricity is going to greatly increase the amount of electricity we need to generate even after aggressive energy efficiency measures. And so um, uh, under one estimate we'll need about on a net basis about one third more electricity to be generated in New York State uh, than is now being uh, generated. We will have to retire virtually all of the existing natural gas electricity generation. We'll probably need some for peaking in order to uh, make up for the intermittency of solar and wind. Uh, but for the most part, um, uh, uh, natural gas generation will have to be gone. Uh, we'll need just massive build out of wind and solar. 
And in order to help facilitate that, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, as part of the New York State budget, the legislature adopted an entirely new process for approving new uh, uh, wind and solar and other uh, renewable facilities, uh, getting rid of the old Article 10 process, uh, which was a complete failure at citing uh, renewable energy facilities and coming up with an entirely uh, new process to build uh, uh, to build out um, uh, wind and solar. Uh, we're going to need to train the workforce uh, to do all of this. Um, uh, uh, th it's going to be a major source of jobs, uh, uh, but we need to train the workforce to, to carry out those jobs. Um, uh, re uh, dealing with the intermittency of solar and wind will require a combination of, of storage and uh, a smart grid and a demand response and uh, perhaps some natural gas peaking. We'll need uh, more transmission lines to carry this electricity from where it is generated to uh, where it's going to be used. Uh, and finally, we need to uh, to deal with the issue that uh, we really uh, have, in a sense, two separate uh, grids in, in New York State, the upstate grid and the downstate grid. The upstate grid is already 88% um, uh, uh, clean uh, uh, from a combination of hydro and, uh, and nuclear and, and wind, whereas the downstate uh, grid is only 27% uh, uh, no emissions, and, and that's about to drop because of the closure of Indian Point. And we need more transmission capacity to carry um, a power from upstate and possibly from Quebec uh, down into, uh, into New York City. Uh, so those are some of the challenges uh, faced. And uh, uh, so, Carl, do we want to go to uh, some questions now, or do we want to go straight to the next speaker? If it's okay with you, Mike, and thank you for that excellent presentation, I'll hold the questions till the end of the panels. Uh, if that uh, does it for you, I'll uh, ask uh, Peter to uh, follow. Thank you, Michael. Great. Um, let me just quickly share my screen. And there we go. Let's see. Oh, wrong screen, apparently. Uh, that looks good to me. <laughs> uh, oh, it does look good. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was showing up the wrong way for me. Uh, so, okay. Try that again. Okay. Is that, you're seeing uh, the slideshow? Yeah. Oh, cows, corn, and crap. You're up. Okay. Well, I, I, I subtitled this talk, Cows, Corn, and Crap, in case your mind wanders. Uh, and so you get the key point of the slideshow uh, right from the very beginning. Uh, you just saw a slide that Mike presented that said agriculture is only 4% of greenhouse gas emissions in New York. So you may wonder, why are we having uh, somebody talk about agriculture? Uh, as you'll see, uh, the agriculture is a much bigger component of greenhouse gas emissions than it's generally accounted for. And when you think about the food system overall, which of course is underlain by agriculture and agriculture only exists really to provide food, uh, that food system contribution to climate change is much, much greater. Uh, much of transportation, industrial processes, residential energy use, all is devoted uh, towards the food system. So before I, I start, I want to, uh, two general thoughts about the food system. One is uh, particularly important now in uh, this COVID pandemic, is the food system is something we take for granted most of the time. And yet when times get tough as now, uh, we realize it is of, of almost unique importance. What people are concerned about uh, after staying healthy is staying fed. And uh, we are seeing many articles about some of the vulnerabilities of the food system. And that often, uh, creates a tremendous amount of concern because it's such an important element. Another curious part of the food system that most people don't realize is how extraordinarily complex it is. You saw that picture of the grid uh, in New York that Mike showed. Uh, you have a few power plants, you have wires connecting to the house, 
you know, comparatively, that's relatively simple. Think about just the breakfast you had this morning or maybe the lunch you just had. Uh, and if you had toast, perhaps, it probably came from wheat or other grains that could have come from many, many states, perhaps New York, but much more likely somewhere in the Midwest, perhaps other countries. If you had a cup of coffee or tea, that came from tropical countries far away. If you had milk, uh, that might have come from New York. New York is one of the largest dairy states, but it could easily have come from California or Wisconsin or other states. If you had fruit, it's almost certainly from another country. Uh, we import about half of our fruit. Uh, and if you had meat, uh, that also could have perhaps come from New York, but much more likely from the major meat producing states uh, all around in the Midwest or even in the West could have been imported. Uh, so dealing with such a complicated system uh, requires uh, tools and thinking. It's a little different from thinking about a, a more local system like the energy system or New York located buildings, uh, it does require thinking on this uh, interconnected, certainly national and really global scale. Um, before we get into climate change, I'm going to try to give a bit of an overview of the food system relatively quickly because frankly, most people, again, take it for granted. We think about food a lot, but we don't think about the food system, where we get our food and how it works. So, uh, and those, those other elements of the food system are actually very important for thinking about how to move forward on agriculture and the food system with respect to climate change, because the co-benefits and the co-harms, as it were, of many aspects of agriculture are critical for the w ability to create a political consensus for necessary policy change. So I will now, let's see. Okay, so uh, there we go. Our, we currently have a food system uh, that it produces an extraordinary amount of food. Indeed, uh, much more food than we actually produce. Uh, and partly as a result of that, a tremendous amount of food is wasted. About 35 to 40% of the food that is grown is actually wasted. Uh, where much of it goes into landfills, it's, most of it is not composted. Where it rots and becomes, uh, it releases methane and is the largest component of most um, landfills. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of it is imported and exported, uh, but for a long time, its main goal has been to produce cheap food, uh, and it has been extraordinarily successful at that. Uh, unfortunately, from a policy perspective, that cheapness uh, comes at a cost, uh, and that cost includes the harm to the farmers themselves. The, it is a system where the, the folks who are actually growing our food get very little of the dollar that is spent on food. A lot of it is spent to process on processors and intermediate steps on the chain, all of which may be necessary, but uh, nonetheless are taking the vast majority of the food system dollar. And as a result, unlike, say, if you're trying to deal with pollution reduction at a refinery where the refinery is owned and the pollution is produced by that refinery, uh, here the agricultural pollution uh, is, uh, is really is it, under the control of those who have the least benefit from the current system. Uh, one thing that's important also so much of climate change is going, and our response to it is going to need address, is going to depend on natural systems. How do we use our land? Are we going to use uh, trees to reforest or convert lands back to grasslands, which absorb carbon? And agriculture becomes a, an extraordinarily important element of that discussion. If you look at this map, you can see that agriculture dominates our use of landscape. That biggest box in the middle is, is pasture and range, largely for cattle. Other big boxes include feed for livestock, about half of the cropland in the US. We have about 400 million acres of cropland, and half of that is grows uh, food, not for people, but for animals. And that's an extraordinarily inefficient use of our land and our food that we're producing. It takes about 15 pounds of grain to get a pound of beef. Uh, it's like driving around an SUV or a Hummer that gets two miles a gallon. Uh, so lots of opportunities uh, 
to think about how we use our land and perhaps re considering that and therefore giving land back to climate absorption opportunities, reforesting uh, and converting back to grassland where the land can become an extraordinary sink for uh, climate emissions. One of the challenges uh, in terms of social issues, but also in terms of economic, and you might have been reading about this in some of the COVID related stimulus packages, is how really since about the depression uh, or even before, uh, the number of farms has gone down by and large and this average size of farms has gone up. It's become a, sit a situation where we have a small number of operations that produce the vast amount of food, but at the same time, we've got a lot of farms. Uh, in New York State, for example, we may have 35,000 farms. The vast majority of those, however, are quite small. Uh, and most of our produce, food is produced by uh, a few, many, many fewer, much larger operations. And uh, as I said, before we get to climate change, uh, it's important to understand the extent to which our agriculture system affects the re other environmental issues and our public health, because those uh, are issues that may be more front of mind for, for many people, including many policymakers, and thus create policy opportunities. For example, drink agriculture is one of the major drivers of drinking water quality uh, impairment. You may have read about the city of Toledo turning off its water supply. That's been an issue in upstate New York where manure from dairy farms uh, contaminates the drinking water from local towns. And of course, drinking water is extraordinarily important uh, and people can easily gather around policies that can protect drinking water. Agriculture is also one of the main drivers of public health concerns. The fact that we are producing food that is largely in many ways unhealthy. Uh, and we can go into this in more detail if people have questions. But again, I, the point I wanna make is that these other impacts from our industrial agriculture system actually create political opportunity. People who are concerned about the toxic exposure, uh, for example, that they, uh, see or, or their families uh, or, or suffer uh, will be interested perhaps in addressing pesticide residues and therefore some of the agricultural systems. So one of the things that is often not understood is the extent to which agriculture contributes to climate change directly. Uh, and there's just a report by the US Department of Agriculture today uh, that would update this uh, pie chart in the upper right upper left of this slide uh, saying it's actually uh, by EPA or USDA's estimate 10.5 percent of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. But that number is really quite low because it doesn't include a number of important factors such as past land conversion, foregone sequestration. Think of all the land that is already be converted. We don't think about uh, because that the carbon emissions from the conversion may have happened decades ago we don't count that. On the other hand, that land could be forest land or grassland absorbing carbon. So we're losing the opportunity to sequester emissions because of the current use of the land. Another reason why agricultural emissions are often not really considered is because their main emissions are methane and nitrous oxide. Methane comes from the cows and the crap part of the title. Uh, cows, uh, because of the way they digest uh, grass, uh, essentially belch or breathe out methane uh, and their waste uh, as it sits on the ground or in, in other uh, systems uh, produces a tremendous amount of methane. And everyone is, I'm sure, familiar with the fact that methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas, 30 times more over 100 years, but 80 times more on the short term. Corn, the other element of our title, uh, is, a, is what drives much of our nitrous oxide emissions. Fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, which itself is very energy intensive to produce, so produces a lot of greenhouse gases in the manufacturer, uh, when applied on land, uh, can be absorbed by the plant, in which case that's terrific and the nitrogen goes into the plant. Uh, 
On the other hand, on average, we apply close to twice as much fertilizer as required in the US. And that excess fertilizer that's not taken up by the plant either goes out into the rivers or into the groundwater. You can think about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico or groundwater contamination and blue baby syndrome or because of microbial action, it becomes nitrous oxide, uh, which is about 300 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And so there's a tremendous amount, about 75% of the nitrous oxide emissions in the US comes from agriculture, and almost all of that is from uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Some is from manure as well. You also have a tremendous amount of uh, carbon dioxide that is produced when soil is tilled uh, or broken up. The soil, natural soil, contains uh, quite a bit of carbon, uh, but then when it's open to the atmosphere, that carbon mixes with oxygen and uh, becomes CO2. And as I've mentioned, there's a, uh, if you've ever tried to drag something over the ground, you can imagine how much energy it takes uh, to drag tractors and plows and tills through the ground. And so there's a tremendous amount of on-farm energy. And again, this is just what happens on the farm itself. That doesn't include the tremendous amount of energy used in say refrigeration or chopping and peeling, all the ways we process food or the distribution of our food around the country or the cooking of your food in your home uh, or the waste, uh, all that food waste, as I mentioned, much of it goes to landfills where it produces uh, methane. So when you think about the food system as a whole, not just what happens on the cropland and the cows, generally the numbers are that the food system is responsible for about 30% of US and world greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Climate change is also important, uh, or agriculture is important to think about climate change also because it is uniquely affected by climate change. More than almost any other sector of the economy, agriculture depends on stable weather patterns. It depends on rain and dry times. It depends on the sun. And so the increase of floods and droughts that we are seeing because of climate change is significantly harming agriculture. Uh, the extreme weathers we're seeing, think of Hurricane Irene uh, in New York and its impact not only on cities and towns and roads, but on agriculture. Uh, in other parts of the country, perhaps more than in New York, the heat waves and the wildfires cause, that are increasingly caused by climate change are, are extreme. And on top of all that, it is changing dramatically the, uh, the pests and the weeds and the diseases that uh, farmers have to fight with all the time. So causing, in addition to flooding your fields or having a drought, you have to worry about more bugs and that uh, can make your land less productive. So climate change is front of center uh, to, many, to anyone who's producing, even if uh, not all farmers wanna use that particular term. The good news here is, and Mike talked about renewable energy and others will talk about clean transportation, is that there are systems of growing a tremendous amount of food that will both reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase the carbon in the soil, thus offsetting what greenhouse gas emissions are released either by the agriculture sector or by other sectors. And these practices are highly productive. Often uh, industrial uh, proponents of industrial ag would like to say that this, is ne this system is necessary to feed the world. Um, but in fact, studies have shown that these uh, more agroecological systems can be highly productive. And that's the case, even though virtually no research uh, has been done, virtually 95% of our agricultural research goes into conventional sources. As we start thinking more about enhancing agroecological practices, uh, they will become even more uh, productive. And what's really important is to understand that the current system of how we grow our food 
is not inevitable. It's not inevitable, sensible farmer choices. It's profoundly affected by policies, by both environmental policies and agricultural policies, most importantly, the US Farm Bill, which is uh, revisited every five years and pays uh, farmers a tremendous amount uh, to undertake certain practices. And so how those payments are shaped affects what far choices farmers make and what we are doing. So the good news there is if policy has created a, a greenhouse gas intensive system, policy can also change that. Now I just mentioned agroecological agro practices. What do I mean by that big term? Uh, if many of those are, are practices that are already used by organic farmers, uh, by other sustainable farmers around the country. Uh, maybe three or 4% of the US food is produced in ways that are extremely uh, good from a greenhouse gas perspective, also reducing uh, water quality impacts and many other harmful impacts. And these are practices that have been used for a long time but we're not talking about going back uh, in history here. We're talking about using these practices that have been around, uh, but perfecting them into with today's modern technologies and science and information opportunities. This picture here just shows a small example of on the left, a annual crop like wheat. And on the other, on the right of each chart is a perennial crop. And you can imagine that perennial crop is storing a tremendous amount more carbon in the soil because of its greater root mass. Uh, it is also much more resilient to floods and droughts than the plant on the left with the much shorter roots. Uh, there are many opportunities. Some are listed here. Uh, and all of these have been proven in New York, around the country, at different scales with different crops. But the challenge is uh, they are not used very widely and we have to change that. And I, I have this technological innovation to really emphasize that we're not talking about going back uh, to primitive methods. We're talking about using nature uh, to help grow our food with using the best of modern technology, such as uh, instead of spraying an entire field with herbicides, using drones to see just where the weeds are and using uh, perhaps a drone or a robot to do just uh, what to spray pesticide just where it's needed. That's a tremendous driver of greenhouse gas emissions as, weather, as well as other uh, impacts. So the good news, the exciting opportunity here is how we can truly transform the agricultural sector. This chart shows our current emissions of you from the US and this shows that by using some of these practices, and this is just using some of the ones that are there, and using the amount of greenhouse gas reduction uh, or the increase in carbon uh, that can be stored in soils, and thus the net reduction of these, and this is data drawn from the Natural Resource Conservation Service and many, many other studies, we can significantly reduce the greenhouse gas footprint of our food system. And indeed, if we use just a, a, a 10 or so practices, and there's dozens of them that are, are possible, we can actually get agriculture to be a net sink of carbon. Uh, of course, we're talking about biological systems, so this is uh, still not, of course, as precise as the difference, say, and if you don't burn a lump of coal, but so the, as the, depending on the land, it can be uh, somewhat lower, somewhat higher, but clearly the opportunities here to make agriculture into a carbon solution rather than a climate problem are extraordinary. And as I mentioned, the trouble is these practices, while well proven, have yet to be fully adopted. So we need to make those changes to the farm bill, to energy laws and policy laws, uh, and to others to create the incentives for doing that. The CLCPA, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Law that Mike mentioned and others will talk about, includes natural solutions, including forestry and agriculture. So we can expect to see such changes in New York and the good news is we're also beginning to see such changes at the federal government. They, after a long time of really ignoring agriculture as an element of climate change, 
We're now seeing activities, uh, hearings in both the House and in the Senate, uh, USDA framework for addressing that. USDA under President Obama established climate hubs and those continue to exist now. And bills have been introduced to dramatically accelerate the addressing agriculture's uh, contribution to climate change. Uh, the states are doing the same. This is a chart that gives you a sense of the number of states that have passed laws or that are considering laws to encourage climate friendly practices in agriculture. Uh, and of course, the COVID pandemic has put a lot of legislatures uh, on hold for a while, but there's a lot of growing enthusiasm. And one last point I want to make is that it's not just how we grow our food, it's what food we grow and therefore what we eat and what it makes, a how every one of us can make a difference. This is a chart from the Global Calculator, one of those many uh, systems you've seen to anticipate future emissions. And you can see that if the world, this is worldwide, if the world adopts a high meat diet, basically other countries adopt the same diet as the US, even with the cleanest energy and the cleanest transportation and the most efficient and cleanest buildings, we're gonna blow through any greenhouse gas target we may hope to have. And on the other hand, if we do nothing but change our diet and reduce and use a lot less meat of the convention of the industrial meat the way it's produced now, we can come very close to our target. So it is important not to think about not just how we grow our food, but what we grow. So thanks very much and back to Carl. Thank you, Peter. That's outstanding. Uh, and thanks for clearing your screen. Next up is Kate Carrera, uh, Environmental Advocates of New York. So Kate, do, do you want to uh, yeah, share, share your screen? Sure. Great. That was wonderful, Peter. Thanks so much. A pleasure. Okay. I must get to the start here. Yes, I see it. Good. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kate Carrera. I'm the Deputy Director of Environmental Advocates in New York. Um, my presentation title is a little bit misleading, but I was too good to pass up um, the pun, and I hope we all can have a smile these days. So I'm planes, trains, and automobiles, really mainly just automobiles. Um, so just a, a quick little brief about um, who environmental advocates are. Um, we're a New York-based um, nonprofit environmental advocacy group. We're based in Albany, New York. Um, we have three program areas of climate, water, and communities. Um, and we do, we monitor all levels of state government, the legislature, the regulatory space, um, championing um, beneficial laws, fighting against the detrimental ones, building coalitions, and bringing more political power to Albany. Um, so what I'm gonna to talk to you quickly uh, or today in the next uh, 20 minutes, and Michael's presented some of what I'm gonna talk about today, which is great, a little um, you know, a preview of the transportation sector. So the transportation emissions and sources, some of the mandates under the new climate law, which we've heard about today, um, the steps New York is taking to decarbonize at the moment, and a bit about the federal rollbacks, which are important. And as Michael suggested, our um, challenges to meeting some of our goals. Um, so where do um, emission, greenhouse emission sources, uh, greenhouse emissions come from the transportation sector? So primarily uh, it comes from different modes of transportation. So vehicles, uh, motor vehicles, trains, um, planes, ships, um, and from burning fossil fuels. Um, over 90% of the fuel um, used in transportation is petroleum based. Um, so you know, that's a significant source. I mean, there are other um, greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted from um, these modes of transportation that um, are worth mentioning different, of course, NOx and SOx are different, certainly are um, smog relating pollutants that come out of tailpipes, um, as well as fluorinated gases that can come out of refrigerated trucks um, and other aerosols. Um, since 1970, and of course we're here on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, so 1970, 50 years ago, um, greenhouse gas transport emissions have almost doubled, which is pretty shocking given that during that period of time we've also had tremendous um, advances in fuel economy. This is um, a, a, a slide or a 
um, a graph taken from the ICCP, um, the IPCC report on transport, which of course Carl mentioned is a great source for a lot of this information. And this just shows you how great the, the emissions are from vehicles. So the pretty much the big blue section is uh, tailpipes. And you can see the smaller areas talk about planes, um, rail pipelines. Um, you would have seen this slide um, before, and this is uh, which basically shows you that in New York State, the largest um, uh, emission um, source is transportation, 36%. Um, I believe nationwide, it's slightly lower at 25%, but in New York State, um, factoring in our large metropolitan uh, area, this makes sense. This next slide, um, I really like, and I think it's important um, before I kind of get into what, what we can do and how we're going about um, mitigating these transportation emissions is understanding the breakdown of emissions. Um, being a lawyer, I would normally not present an equation because that feels foreign to me, um, but I think this is a, a good way of explaining, and this also comes from the IPCC report about how transport um, emissions break down. And the reason that's important is that those are the areas or the components where mitigation is possible. So um, the first uh, bucket really is, um, the first component is the mode, modal choice. So that is, like the, that is the mode of transportation. So a plane, train, an automobile. And so the total emissions is basically a factor of all of these things. Um, the second is the fuel carbon intensity. So this goes to the type of fuel that the, that the transport um, mode uses. So when I say fuel, it could be um, traditional petroleum-based fuel, it could be a biofuel, a low carbon fuel, a diesel, and also um, EV. So while an electric vehicle doesn't use fuel per se, it would be captured as part of its carbon fuel intensity and it would have an, a full electric a vehicle would have no carbon intensity. Um, the next portion is the energy intensity. So that's really the efficiency of the infrastructure itself. So how efficient is the engine um, that's been developed to um, move the, the transportation mode? Um, and the last bit, which is uh, interesting, is activity. So that's really a function of the number and the distance of journeys. So you kind of take all of those factors, but then you need to, you need to multiply it by how many journeys um, and how many times. So some of the areas that we can address, some of the mitigation measures that we can address in that area um, is often behavioral aspects. So changes in our behavior, but also relates to kind of our development, our land use structures in you know, more integrated um, transit oriented development where we're relying on um, vehicles for those short trips and using um, having more pedestrian ways. So we can have beha behavioral aspects influence our transportation um, admissions. Um, the next slide is, we've heard a little bit about this um, earlier in the presentation, but I'd like to take a few moments to talk about it. Um, as Michael had mentioned in his first slide, uh, New York State passed the climate um, the Climate Leadership Community and Protection Act last year. And this is really, you know, nation leading um, climate legislation where um, with an, uh, an overall goal of 100% of elimination of anthropogenic sources of emissions. So while this, well, net, net goal. Um, as Michael had mentioned, the mandates for this and requirements or mandate, meaning that um, it's required by law and enforceable is that 85% of those emissions be reduced by 2050. And there's some interim targets um, set out there that Michael also talked about. Now there's a 15% emission reduction that can be achieved by a limited offset program. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning all of this is of course, transportation is one of the sectors that will need to be considered in meeting this overall goal. Um, the 15% emissions uh, reduction um, offset program, it wasn't intended that this offset program apply to transportation. However, um, the offset program is not ex 
doesn't explicitly exclude transportation from, from it. So the offset program does exclude um, gen electric gen uh, generation. Um, so it's a little bit unclear how this will play out. Um, and as we talked about before, how we get to these goals has to be scoped out in, an, in a scoping plan. And that is the job of the Climate Action Council, which we already mentioned, which is a, a group of 22 members, including um, uh, commissioners and heads of state agencies, one of which would be the Department of Transportation. Um, so that, that through that uh, Climate Action Council, there will be different advisory boards um, created in working groups that will deal with each sector, one sector being transport. So we would imagine during that process, the Transportation Advisory Board would do the scoping necessary to holistically look at how we start achieving um, reductions um, in the transportation sector. The next um, I'm going to go through just uh, a number of ways um, the state has already started um, making progress in reducing emissions um, from the transportation sector. Um, it really is a mix of a number of different um, programs and um, commitments. And, uh, you know, I, I would imagine that the work of the Climate Action Council or the advisory group on transport is to really look at all of these different components that have been started. Um, and try to find, you know, and figure out how do you, how do we address this more holistically to meet, to meet the mandate. So um, one, I think, which is really important to start with is the MTA, so the uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority's commitment um, to a clean fleet. So 2040 clean commitment, um, clean fleet cl commitment. Um, and this is 100% electrification of the MTA's bus fleet by 2040. Um, and this is really significant um, for a couple reasons. So it's the largest trans, um, it's the largest uh, public transit authority uh, in the US and they operate about uh, almost just under 6,000 um, buses. And with 100% electrification, this actually drives the market share for electric um, buses and vehicles. So it's about 10% of the debt of bus of bus purchases in North America. So this is a significant driver, um, the MTA's commitment to spur um, the demand for electric uh, buses. Um, and this will certainly jumpstart the growth um, of the electric bus manufacturing um, industry. Uh, a Columbia study found that total electrification of the MTA bus fleet would yield um, a reduction of almost 575,000 metric tons of carbon of CO2 equivalent per year. So this is a significant reduce in emissions when this uh, meeting this goal. Um, the next program uh, that New York State is involved in is called the ZEV program. So this is zero emission vehicle program. Um, this is an interesting program with a history that comes from California. So it requires all new vehicles sold in New York State to meet the California emission standard. And it sounds a little bit strange, but in 2013, um, the EPA granted California a, prevent, a preemption waiver for its advanced clean car regulations under the Clean Air Act, uh, which basically required that um, low emission vehicles, greenhouse gas standards, and um, zero emission vehicles be delivered um, uh, as part of um, a program in, in California. Um, so what happened was we, we are allowed, meaning New York State is allowed to adopt uh, the California standards, and that's what they've done. So New York's uh, ZEV or LEV program, one is low admissions um, vehicles and the other is zero, um, focuses up that all new vehicles sold in New York State must meet these California's emission standards, which of course are more stringent than the federal. Um, the program requires that manufacturers deliver zero emission vehicles to New York State. So this is plug-in hybrids, uh, battery electric vehicles, as well as hydrogen fuel cell. Um, the ZEV program, which is administered through DC, um, also has a, programs, um, has a program to help incentivize municipalities in purchasing uh, electric vehicles. 
and up to um, $250,000 for the installation of charging stations. So I think another important point about um, electrification of vehicles in particular, it's not only just the vehicle itself, but it's the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure that goes along with it. So at the same, so these both programs have to really run simultaneously in terms of driving the demand and technology for electric vehicles, but ensuring that there's enough char charging infrastructure available. Um, they don't work without one another. Um, the interesting thing about <clears throat> the ZEB program, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and I think, uh, I'm not sure if Michael mentioned this before, um, but the Trump administration has recently withdrawn California's preemption waiver um, for this, uh, for the greenhouse gas standards and the ZEV mandate. Um, California is suing the Trump administration and New York has joined that lawsuit. Um, so it remains to be seen, but this of course is just one, uh, you know, another example um, of the federal government undoing really important aspects to decarbonizing um, our economy. Um, at the moment, I believe there's about 40, 47,000 electric vehicles registered in New York State. Um, the ZEV program has a target of 850,000 electric vehicles by 2025. So that's about five years away. Um, one other one I've mentioned here is the Evolve. This is run through the New York Power Authority. Also just a, a program to help um, with charging infrastructure. Moving on um, to a couple other ones. These are a little bit, these are perhaps a bit newer um, and some are commitments. So the first one I've mentioned here is the New York State adoption of the California bus rule. Now the Governor Cuomo actually had made a commitment to this um, in his state of, state of the State Address just this year um, in January. And what the California bus rule is, is 100% electrification of the public transit system by 2040. Um, and the governor has announced to adopt the same rule for 100% um, electrification of bus fleets in five upstate um, upstate cities. As, as I mentioned on the previous slide, New York City is already committed to the 100% electrification. So this commitment would be adding on to that and including other upstate uh, cities. Um, another area that will help in terms of mitigation of transport, of transport um, carbon emissions is the e-scooter and e-bike uh, legislation that was recently just passed uh, a couple weeks ago in the New York State budget. So legalization of those, those scooters um, that helps to go to the activity of using, you know, uh, less uh, carbon, uh, emitting less carbon and becoming more efficient in getting around uh, in places. So reducing the need for tailpipe um, vehicles. The e-scooter and the bike, e-bike legislation has a number of um, criteria of like what classifies to be an e-scooter and e-bike. Um, it actually amends the, the, um, the vehicle and traffic law um, to allow for these, these um, these vehicles to be defined as a vehicle. Um, the next one is congestion pricing. And many of you who are in New York City would know, um, have heard about this program. Um, this was passed as part of the New York State budget last year. I think there was a hope that it would be implemented as early as um, 2021. Um, I think there have been some roadblocks uh, between uh, the state and the federal government that have um, presented themselves over the last couple months, um, but this would effectively be the first congestion, price, congestion pricing scheme in the US, um, uh, applying a charge for vehicles traveling into um, a central area of New York City of 60th Street and below, I believe. Um, and the last one I would mention is also part of this uh, larger puzzle of how we're trying to address transportation emissions is something called the Transportation and Climate Initiative. This is a collective of Northeastern and Mid-Atlantic states and DC um, that have come together to devise a regional approach for transportation emissions. Um, New York is a, is a member of, of this. Um, at this time, the, the member states are working together to develop and finalize an MOU 
which would go to explain, you know, which would go to um, explain how how this collective of this regional approach would work. Um, you know, I think the CLCPA, the climate law in New York, provides an interesting overlay of to how New York would participate in um, a regional program, because of course we are um, subject to um, the mandates that we have created in New York State. So certainly any participation that New York um, would do in this in this regional um, uh, program would have to have the overlay of the CLCPA. So this is something that's in development and we would have to, remains to be seen exactly how, how New York would, would participate. Um, one thing I wanted to just quickly talk about is Electrify New York. So this is a campaign um, that Environmental Advocates is, is uh, co uh, helped launch with a number of other partners. Um, and really the idea of this campaign um, is, has, has a number of components. So first is to ensure there's transparency in the MTA process for electrification, um, but also to be a, a resource uh, and um, a voice uh, for, for, for municipalities and helping municipalities um, uh, electrify their fleets and um, making commitments. So, as well as um, environmental justice aspects and job creation. So one thing that we have been doing as part of this Electrify campaign is trying to, to um, gather commitments from um, municipalities and local leaders on, on a commitment to electrify their fleets. Um, so there's some tools that are part of this website if you're interested that, that do help um, assist, assist there. Um, just my last slide is just a little bit about the federal rollbacks. Um, you know, there's many, many more than this. This is just a few that uh, relate to the transportation and some. So one rollback that was finalized, and I think, believe this is the one that Michael mentioned, was the Obama era fuel economy standards for light, for cars and light trucks. Um, that's also being challenged at the moment. Um, and this will if this were to um, continue, or if this were to actually um, uh, be, if, the, if, they, if they were unable to challenge this successfully, this would have a significant impact on our ability to meet our goals, um, our transportation emission goals. Um, the second one um, is the revocation of California's power, which as I mentioned, which is this is California's preemption waiver to allow for the ZEV program and other um, programs to deliver um, zero emission vehicles. Um, at one, there's a repeal of a requirement that the state and regional authorities track tailpipe emissions um, for traveling on federal highways. This is, you know, an, an important tool that we use to ensure to understand how many emissions are being tracked. So this is, you know, not a great um, advancement. As well as lifted a summertime ban on the use of E15 and gasoline blended um, ethanol. So An another example of how um, um, these thing, uh, these protections we've had in place um, for many years are, are not helping our climate change goals and objectives. So that's about all for me. Thank you, Kate. That's fantastic. Excellent job, Greg. Hale is next. Uh, thank you. Your, Kate, your screen is down. Greg, if you have, Greg, I don't see you. Are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? I see you and I hear you now. Welcome. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, just trying to get to, uh, presentation mode here. Good, I can there see There we go. Um, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the City Bar putting this uh, panel together. <laughs> it's put together in uh, more, more normal times. We've been talking about this for a while. Um, and happy Earth Day, everybody. It's a, it's a weird Earth Day, but we need to keep moving forward. So I'm going to try to uh, zip through here and save some time for uh, Blue to get to his presentation. 
Uh, normally, I have to spend some time uh, explaining the uh, CLCPA, and that has been covered very nicely, so I will fly through that. And I want to talk mostly about buildings, decarbonizing buildings. Um, we have a roadmap underway to uh, achieve a carbon neutral building stock by uh, the middle of the century. Um, main part of that is, uh, or the primary part is electrification. And then I want to talk about a, a few programs that uh, we already have underway that I think are, are really interesting. Um, so hopefully this is a little of the uh, positive news of what we actually know we can do and, and uh, laying that out for you. So anybody not familiar with NYSERDA, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, uh, it's all about driving the clean energy economy forward and uh, making it more cost effective. Um, so back to the IPCC that uh, Carl spoke about earlier. Um, here's a comment that they made in their uh, 2018 update report. And um, it's a daunting comment, but I'd like to uh, rebut it a little bit. First of all, um, it was made before the uh, COVID-19 crisis. So all of a sudden we are seeing that there is the ability to take major changes to the way we inhabit the world to address crises. So let's just imagine that we actually took a uh, globally coordinated, at least relatively coordinated, approach similar to this COVID uh, response to climate change um, and the power of that. And it makes so much sense because while the current pandemic is a tragic, a lot of human loss, um, the first panel made it really clear that the, the devastation from climate change is orders of magnitude larger that's facing us uh, in the future. And um, the positive here is that to solve this, we don't have to go through a huge economic retraction like we're doing today. On the contrary, it's about investing smartly and expanding economic activity. So I, I do think that uh, we've shown that we, we can do this. And you, you look at the, uh, the other point here would be the Industrial Revolution at the beginning of the last century over several decades really transformed the way humans live and, and work in the world. And think about the tools that they had at that point. No computers. They did it with slide rules. Um, so don't tell me we can't do it. What we need is political will. And what we don't have in Washington is political will, right? And it's not just benign neglect. It's uh, people have been making the points, you know, it, it, it is a, a direct attack and, and just advancing uh, the global warming. But there's good news out there, and I want to uh, I want to turn to that. So this is a map from uh, 2019 of March. Uh, you guys may remember we were allowed outside of our uh, houses and apartments back then. Um, and just to explain what we have going on here, the different shades. This is about states that have enacted 100% clean electricity standards. Green is legislative. Dark green means it's passed. Light green means it's introduced. Orange means it's anticipated. Blue means it's a uh, executive order or a ballot measure. Dark blue, like New Jersey here, is enacted. And light blue, you don't see it yet, but we'll get to it, um, is introduced. So here's March 2019. You got four states. California, Hawaii, uh, New Jersey, and well, three and a half District of Columbia, right? Uh, taxation without representation. Um, so let's look, put the map in motion here and see what happens from just from March of last year to today. So Washington passes uh, legislation, Nevada passes legislation. Colorado introduces a legislative, or I'm sorry, an executive order. New Mexico passes legislation. Wisconsin, executive order introduced. Maine introduces legislation. Pennsylvania introduces legislation. 
North Carolina executive order introduced, Puerto Rico enacts legislation. And we're still just in May of 2019, Iowa just introduced legislation. Now we go, uh, see what happened there. Okay. Uh, you got Colorado passing its executive order. You've got Wisconsin passing its executive order. You got Maine passing legislation. Vermont introduces legislation. Florida introduces legislation. Virginia just passed uh, legislation um, a couple months ago. Uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island enact 100% uh, executive orders. Uh, Oregon introduces legislation. Arizona gets in the, the mix with an executive order, and uh, Michigan uh, introduces the legislation, and there for dramatic effect, a little out of order, but uh, North passes the CLCPA. So look at the change from uh, a year ago to today. All of these states taking action because they understand that a 100% clean grid is the key that allows electrifying transportation and electrifying the building sector to be actual decarbonization strategies. So, like I mentioned, um, not gonna spend much time here, but uh, just reemphasize that our 100% uh, clean electric goals, uh, 2040. That's uh, one of the earliest uh, target dates out there and 70% renewable electricity by 2030 on the path there. Just one point about the CLCPA that, that I don't think has been mentioned today that I think is really important on the bottom of this slide. It requires that 35% of the benefits of the state's investments in uh, the clean energy transition with a target of 40% of those benefits flow to disadvantaged communities. So there's a big focus on equity in this bill. Uh, the bill did in, include a uh, codification of a major new energy efficiency program in New York. It's essentially tripling our energy efficiency uh, targets. And um, what it will do is deliver nearly one third of the greenhouse gas emission reduction that is required to meet our 40% GHG reduction goal by 2030. So that's a great step in the right direction. But again, this is one third of 40% and we got to get to a carbon neutral economy. So we got to go a lot deeper. Big element here is workforce. This is a job engine. Uh, at the end of 2018, we had uh, almost 160,000 clean energy jobs in New York State. Um, the largest number of those come from uh, energy efficiency installations. Last year, we, we, uh, the numbers aren't quite out yet, but uh, we're pretty sure that we added another 12,000 uh, clean energy jobs. The downside is uh, this is a, like many other businesses, the clean energy industry is shrinking right now. A, a lot of the layoffs, probably uh, we've seen estimates of at least about 5,000 layoffs through March. Um, and hopefully we can get we can staunch that bleeding. NYSERDA and DPS are working very hard on figuring out how to uh, modify their programs to get more money out into the marketplace um, and, and take some steps that will allow clean energy jobs to be among the first that get reintroduced as we open up the economy. So one thing we're doing is working on uh, protocols for COVID safe work working once uh, the New York on pause order is lifted and uh, lots of other program modifications working to um, allow people to do things from a, a, a remote perspective and um, and also to change uh, contract uh, timelines and the ability to um, get more money out faster in the, the milestones of uh, incentives. So our roadmap um, any way you do the math here, whether it's 85 by 50 or 80 by 50, like uh, New York City has, it really requires a carbon neutral statewide building stock. That means all of the buildings in this state as a portfolio emitting zero carbon um, on, a, on a net basis. So what does it mean to have a carbon neutral building? If we just de decarbonize the grid, 
like we like we are on uh, uh, required to do under CLCPA, and then make your building all electric. Are we done? Well, technically, that would be a building that would not be emitting carbon. But if we don't focus on energy efficiency and load management and real-time response to grid conditions, then we'll wind up requiring you know, a much larger incremental amount of electricity than, than Michael talked about earlier. Um, so in order to make our uh, targets and our task of uh, grid decarbonization easier, we really need to focus on deep efficiency and we need to be able to have buildings that can manage their loads, so store energy through either batteries or, or thermal storage systems to be able to use the energy in the building um, at times when the grid is, um, is not at peak. So long way to go. Um, what we're trying to do with this roadmap is inform the Climate Action Council under the uh, CLCPA as to pathways that will be required to uh, achieve a carbon neutral building stock. Uh, it involves a lot of research um, it's coming into uh, fruition where we've had a number of stakeholder engagement sessions, I think about uh, eight or nine, and we have a couple more set for this spring. And it's really, I don't know how many uh, real estate lawyers we have on, on the phone. I, I happen to be one in a, from an earlier life. Um, but the, the key is sending this market signal. And between the CLTPA and, and the city's um, climate legislation that, uh, that actually has enacted a cap on greenhouse gas emissions on all buildings over 25,000 square feet, and that cap will come down over time. Um, for the first uh, compliance period is 2024. It, people need to understand that they need to start focusing on the emissions from their buildings. And that is largely about the energy use intensity in your buildings and how much, uh, how much um, fossil fuels you're, you're burning on site. So if you're not actually thinking about this when you're building a new building or you're doing a substantial renovation, then you're really baking in obsolescence from the day your building uh, opens or the day that that renovation is finished. Also, it's important to understand it's not just about energy savings, but there are a lot of um, uh, co-benefits come along with this. Health, comfort, productivity, very important. You wind up with improved or air quality um, through a lot of these measures, and also the, the ability um, to in, increase resilience of buildings and livability in uh, times when the grid goes down. So this is meant to be a living document. We uh, don't think we'll know um, within the next year exactly how we get from here to 2050 in a carbon neutral building stock, and we intend to uh, introduce iterations of this every uh, four or five years. This year we are focusing, or this iteration, we're focusing on four sectors, single family houses, multifamily residential, um, office buildings, and the higher education classrooms and dorms. And it's not just new construction. Uh, new construction is uh, relatively easier. In fact, we know how to build net zero energy, net zero carbon buildings today. And in fact, if you, if you start with that the, the net zero energy or carbon as a goal, an important goal of your development from the beginning. Um, there are a lot of uh, a lot of data coming in showing that it's a very modest, if any, incremental cost to build it that way today. So we really need to drive our energy codes to make this a requirement like California has. Uh, and we're working on that and hopefully by 2030, uh, you'll be required to build in this way. But more than three quarters of the buildings that will be in New York State in 2050 are already here today. So the real task is trying to figure out how to get at existing buildings. And you can do those through comprehensive retrofits all at once, particularly when you're planning to do a major uh, renovation of your building. Um, and you can also figure out how to do it at a, phasing in a capital plan over time so that as different 
components of your building reach the end of their useful life and are replaced, um, you do it in the right way and you wind up with a carbon neutral building at the, at the end of that cycle. There's a lot in our roadmap. Um, this is a way to get a lot of words on the slide without people in my uh, organization yelling at me. Um, so <laughs> these are different chapters that are in there. Building electrification is key, and I'm going to make a, uh, a point about that in a second. In this case, value proposition is also very important. Uh, what technologies are out there that will, will help us along the way? And then what's next? You know, we'll, one of the big points of um, this roadmap will be laying the framework and then deciding what we really need to um, research and demonstrate as uh, next steps over the next five years or so to, uh, to take us further. So the idea we're trying to get here uh, by the end of uh, the first quarter of 2021, roughly a year from today, we'll have a, a final draft or a final roadmap published. The first draft we're targeting uh, being complete by uh, June or July of this summer, and then we'll take out a presentation of the roadmap on a uh, kind of a statewide um, roadshow to uh, introduce a lot of different uh, stakeholders to it, get comments, feedback, compile all that, and come to the final draft. So one roadmap's never enough. So we uh, actually have a building electrification roadmap, which is a sister document to ours. It's a little different in that it's focused on a 10-year um, time frame. So the idea is to figure out by 2030 what the state of the market needs to be for uh, heat pumps and electrification to get us on our path to the, uh, the 2050 targets. And one thing I think is really important about heat pumps to understand, and it goes back to Anel's uh, presentation in the first panel, is that remember that heat pumps actually work in both directions. So they heat and they cool. Um, they, so they heat and they cool. So if you're, if you're electrifying a NYCHA building and doing it with uh, air source or ground source heat pumps, um, you're not only reducing the carbon emissions, but you are adding cooling, which is so important in this time when temperatures are getting hotter and everybody was talking about the, the issues of heat waves in the summertime. So let me just spend a little bit of time talking about what I think are some really exciting programs uh, on building decarbonization. Um, I'm going to focus on Retrofit New York and the Buildings of Excellence. Retrofit New York is um, an adaptation of a successful model from Europe. It was started in the Netherlands called Energy Sprong, which means energy leap. And um, they've already, uh, sorry, my computer's telling me it needs to restart, which is not a good idea. Um, sorry. Uh, so, uh, Energy Sprong uh, is a uh, this Dutch model. They've uh, hit set, uh, over 15,000 units already. And the idea, what they're doing here, the house on the right has been retrofit, the house on the left has not. The idea is that you wrap your um, entire existing building with a new shell. So you're doing it from the exterior so you don't have to displace the residents. You're not emptying the building and attacking it from the inside, you're going from the outside in. And it uses prefabricated panels built in a factory, very high performance specs with the windows and doors already integrated, and then they're attached to the building. The so same thing with the roof. Um, and then because they're highly insulated and well air sealed, you can downsize all of your electrical mechanical systems and um, wind up with a, a very low energy consuming building that is supported by solar panels on the roof. Big part about this is being able to do it at a lower cost. The way we get this to happen at scale is to bring the cost of a net zero retrofit down to the cost of a building as usual rehabilitation. And we can do this through the use of prefabricated technology. So when the energy sprung guys go back to this slide and say, this is not actually about the buildings, it's about the cars. 
you know, that's the same model of Volkswagen Golf um, from 30 years ago and today. And the advance in the automobile industry has just left the construction industry in the dust. You know, you get so much more value at roughly the same cost of, uh, of a car 100 years ago. And that's because the whole system has been industrialized. It's all built around this um, industrial system that, that takes a, a chassis of, of what they call a skateboard. And these can turn into you know, dozens of different finished models and colors and options. And, and all these things are integrated into this whole process. The suppliers are all feeding into that. The whole marketing and, and customer service chains are all um, uh, all set up to facilitate that structure. So you get to a very low cost product. And what hasn't happened in the construction industry is anything like that. So McKinsey points this out as well. Uh, and they have a very interesting study that shows you, this goes back to 1995. If you take back to 1960, it's the same story. Productivity in construction has not increased since 1960, where other industries have been going up rapidly and and it, it's why construction is so expensive um there are lots of rational reasons for this that are in the report but i focus here on the 10 time five to ten time productivity boost that um that is uh, possible by going to a prefabricated system so what you're doing is going from the old way, let's see if I can get back to functioning. Yeah, the old way, um, here is a, a set of, of uh, workers applying an external stucco or EFA solution. So it's very on-site labor intensive. It's bespoke, every project is its own thing. And the new way is to use these factories to build these high performance panels so it's a very controlled environment. You know the performance you're going to get. You have your triple pane windows baked into the to these uh, wall units, and then you truck them on site and attach them to the building. That can be done in three days, a unit on site. In fact, they did it in one day as sort of a promotional stunt, uh, one of these buildings in, in Europe. So the old system, kind of Rube Goldberg uh, structure of uh, different um, all electric, uh, mechanical heating, domestic hot water systems there. And the new way is very integrated um, components that have all of your heating and cooling structures in them and just plug and play with the, uh, with the panels. So what they've been able to do is reduce the cost over about five or six years by 60%. So they're now producing at 40% of the initial round. And that's through this prefabrication, it's through learning, it's through innovation, it's through scale. And we believe we can make that happen here in New York State. We're working very hard on this. We've been at it for a number of years now and have a bunch of partners around the state and around the country. A lot of acronyms here, but the Department of Energy is very interested in this with the national labs. And we collaborate with them. Um, the Dutch, but also our friends in California, Vancouver. We're very involved in New York City on this too. So I think that's all a really exciting um, idea for the future. Just a couple more slides here. Uh, New York stretch code, NYSERDA is very involved in advancing the codes. Um, we just released a stretch code that is uh, significantly higher than the base code and uh, significantly New York City passed our stretch code. So it becomes effective May 12th, 2020 and makes your energy projects um, meet much higher uh, standards. Buildings of Excellence is a design competition. The awards up to a million dollars coming from NYSERDA. This is um, focused on multifamily buildings so far. Um, and we've had one round. We have a second round uh, that's open to the public right now with submissions due um, May 27th. So if you know anybody who's, uh, who's got a building under design um, and you're looking to make it a high performance building, there's substantial economic uh, assistance that's available. And then a few projects 
This is Net Zero Village uh, in Rotterdam, New York. It's uh, entirely Net Zero, doing phase two because it's doing so well. Um, it, you know, it, it works. It works economically, particularly for new build, new construction already. Um, some mixed use construction. We have another program uh, that's done in conjunction with the economic state, or I'm sorry, Empire State Development an economic development program. So if you'll if you're building a new building in New York State and you're getting ESD support and you're willing to do it to net zero, then there's up to a million dollars uh, available to you under that program. And then we're also doing community scale programs under that uh, that same initiative. Um, NYU got support last year. So did SUNY Albany talking about how do you make net zero on a community level. Now you're starting to talk about all of the different elements. It's the buildings, it's the transportation, it's the open space. So a lot going on. Um, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna make these slides available and I have an appendix of additional NYSERDA programs in there in case anybody wants to take a look at them. So thanks very much and I'll turn my screen back over. Excellent. Fine. Thank you so much, you Greg. Go. Good. Okay, you're down. So Lou, uh, in the power hitting fifth spot, you're up. Um, that was outstanding, Greg. Really, thank thank you so much. There are a lot of programs there I'd never heard of before. So that's good to know. Good to have good news. Hi, all. Hi, How's Lou. I see your stuff. Good. And you can see my slides? Yep, looks good. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks to the bar associations for hosting us and um, thanks to Matt and his team for inviting me to participate. Thanks as well to my esteemed fellow panelists. It's been great to be with you. And thanks especially to our audience today for sharing a big part of your Earth Day uh, with this important program and happy, I guess, um, pandemic clouded Earth Day to all of you. Um, so we've heard uh, quite a bit about the climate goals of the CLCPA, um, uh, a, a few allusions to the equity and environmental justice goals of the CLCPA. So I'm happy to be wrapping things up with a focus on the equity and environmental justice goals of the Climate uh, Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, and I say this, and I present my remarks today really by way of urging uh, folks who will be continuing to work on climate policy in New, New York to increase our emphasis on equity and environmental justice, both in terms of kind of the implementation of the CLCPA, which we've heard uh, qu quite a lot about today, but also obviously um, the continuing path forward for, uh, you know, more, more, um, more aggressive and well-financed uh, climate mitigation policies for New York State. And uh, New York Renews, I just want to start there because that's really been the coalition that has put the most emphasis on equity and environmental justice issues in the climate fight in New York State. And substantially, many of you know, some of you may not know, the CLCPA is a policy of New York Renews developed over four years in a, in a grassroots uh, process of democratic development following something known as the HEMAS principles. Um, I've been active on the steering committee of New York Renews for many years and also on the policy committee and had a significant hand in shaping the CLCPA as well as helping to win the fight last spring. Um, just in a nutshell, for folks who may not know, New York Renews is really a unique statewide climate justice coalition. We're 200 members strong members all over the state at this point. Uh, certainly by climate st standards, a highly multiracial coalition, multi-sectoral coalition, including trade unions, traditional greens, and a strong cohort of environmental justice organizations, as many of you know. Um, and as I mentioned, the CLCPA was really the product of four years of grassroots policy development by the coalition, and then a grassroots driven policy fight uh, in the 2019 legislative session that we ultimately won. Um, I can't really, in the time that I have, I can't really um, 
uh, begin to kind of g give you a, a, a for those who who may who may not know as much about environmental justice, kind of a, a, a history lesson or even a sound definition of what environmental justice is. But I I um, I invite you to just let this image sit in your mind um, uh, as I shift to a much more a much wonkier set of slides. Uh, some of you know, some of you may know of the Battle of Warren County in the starting in the late 1970s and the early uh, and, and really um, uh, re bursting into public and national consciousness in the early 1980s with a series of really uh, um, a profound um, community demonstrations and ultimately it was a toxic landfill uh, fight that looks a lot like many, many other toxic landfill fights before and after, but this was a moment that really put environmental justice on the national map. And this is an image that I carry with me all the time, thinking about the tears in these young women's eyes. And um, just the, what must have been the experience of indignity and disrespect that would motivate um, young people to march down the highway carrying a sign um, trying to make people understand, namely white people, that you know we too care about our future, we too care about our, our lives, and so should you. Um, uh, if I were to boil it down, I would describe environmental justice as fighting and reversing environmental racism. Um, if you want to um, uh, use a slightly more, I guess, scientific term, you could say disproportionate um, environmental harms faced by communities of color, but I'll call it environmental racism for purposes of this conversation. Um, so environmental racism is one of the most consistent and pervasive findings in the social science research and public health sciences research. You could, I could present 30 slides of ex equally compelling sort of slices at the data, but here's one that I find particularly compelling. So environmental racism is means where white people produce most more pollution than they breathe, and where black and brown people breathe more pollution than they produce. And you can see kind of the stark discrepancies in this um, bar graph quite clearly. Um, a local perspective um, is this is just um, and 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 Al and others are, are are of course deeply familiar with this sort of mapping. Um, this is just a side by side image of um, asthma hospitalization rate, rates and poverty rates across New York City, and the two slides are basically mirror images of each other. Um, this is a uh, pretty striking a uh, comparison or bar graph uh, looking at ad added cancer risk by race across New York State and you see people of color have nearly twice the uh, rate of added cancer risk compared to white people um, and this is added cancer risk from hazardous air pollutants and I call it the diesel difference because something like 90% of added cancer risk from hazardous air pollutants comes from trucks, from diesel emissions. So I want to boil down sort of the issue with um, like why it's important to think about and integrate environmental justice into decarbonization policy. Um, and my headline's dramatic, but it's true. Decarbonization is indifferent to local pollution disparities. And I have a quote from a prominent think tank that I think kind of captures this idea. The environmental harm of carbon dioxide, namely climate change, depends upon the total global concentration and not its specific location of origin. The environmental benefit from preventing the emissions of one ton of CO2 is identical, regardless of where the pre prevention and uh, also, aka abatement occurs. So obviously the problem with a, a sort of attitude toward carbon mitigation along those lines is that greenhouse gas sources 
emit fossil fuel co-pollutants, most importantly particulate matter, which we've heard a lot about in terms of as a driver of COVID um, uh, inequities of infection and, and fatalities by race. A greenhouse gas sources emit fossil fuel co-pollutants directly into specific communities. So location uh, uh, of, of greenhouse gas sources actually does matter if you live <laughs> in such communities. And these co-pollutants are well known to drive uh, often large health disparities by race. And so like the, 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 um, the, the, the single biggest um, point that I would make in terms of thinking about integrating equity and environmental justice into into greenhouse gas mitigation is quite simple. Environmentally just greenhouse gas mitigation means prioritizing emissions reductions and related investments in the most pollution burdened communities. Prioritizing the get greenhouse gas mit mitigation strategies for the most pollution burdened communities is really the key to having an environmentally just greenhouse gas policy. So this is what we fought for tooth and nail in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, that principle of, of, of prioritizing localized pollution reductions in disadvantaged communities. And um, what I'm gonna just walk you through now are all the various components, a little forensic unpacking of the CLCPA to give you a little bit of a guided tour of how we integrated that environmental justice principle and, and also equity goals into the CLCPA. So right at the outset in the legislative findings and declarations of intent, um, we have a statement here that basically um, uh, reflects exactly what I just said in the previous slide. And I just have it italicized here for you. Actions undertaken by New York State to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions should prioritize the safety and health of disadvantaged communities, should control potential regressive impacts of future climate change mitigation and adaptation policies on these communities, and should prioritize the allocation of public investments in these areas. So this is an overarching principle of the Climate Leadership Act. Um, a second feature that we fought hard for um, and that we're very excited about and this has been mentioned, is the establishment of a climate justice working group, the primary function of which will be to develop a sophisticated uh, formulae, formulae for identifying um, a specific set of disadvantaged communities, environmentally and economically disadvantaged communities across New York State, which then become um, a, a target for um, particularly for um, uh, uh, a community investment mandate that we establish in another part of the bill. So the Climate Justice Working Group it is an important part of the bill in terms of uplifting um, a specific set of disadvantaged communities to be prioritized for protections of the bill and for related investments toward the zero emissions goals. Here's what others had mentioned, and I just want to spell out a little bit more. It's a 40% mandate uh, called, the, we call it the Disadvantaged Community Investment Mandate. And basically it's applicable to all state agencies uh, who are told that they, they must work together to ensure that 40%, a goal of 40%, and no less than 35% as a legal, legally mandatory minimum of, of, of the, the totality, the whole portfolio of clean energy and uh, spending. And this, in, this in includes in sort of indirect clean energy spending in the form of en uh, housing efficiency and, and, and transportation. So big pots of money there that um, are, come under the 40% mandate. Um, that those resources at the level of 35% should be targeted for the benefit of disadvantaged communities. Um, New York News has developed a, a specific policy guidance to 
assist agencies in their compliance with the 40% community investment mandate. And agencies are, uh, shortly after Governor Cuomo signed the bill into the law, we were already hearing from agencies like NYSERDA, nice, hey, can you help us understand how we can be compliant with the 40% mandate, which has been great. And the state is already publicly flagging um, its intent to comply with the 40% mandate in certain uh, current and future areas, um, including um, uh, hopefully spending a reggie proceeds where we've never really had a community investment mandate before. And it was also flagged in the budget uh, process this year with the um, establishment of the Mo Mother Nature Bond Act that the 40% mandate will apply to proceeds of the Bond Act should it pass uh, next fall. <clears throat> I'm going to skip that. Um, so, uh, also, folks have mentioned, you know, there's a a, 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 hard, a hard kind of 85% mandate of direct emissions reductions, and then a 15% window for um, carbon neutral reductions. And this was actually a little bit of a casualty of final negotiations. And I, I think we believe this is something that um, Governor Cuomo, in particular, wanted. Um, basically, it's a carbon uh, neutral window to create an offset program, as others have been mentioned, uh, for the benefit of, I guess, industries that might be, um, say, the hardest to, to achieve compliance with the 85% mandate by 2050. So, so some certain industries like um, cement and uh, aluminum smelting, one might imagine. And just for the sake of information for folks that may not understand, a carbon offset is basically a program where uh, a given facility um, uh, in lieu of being able to reduce its own direct emissions in a community is allowed to purchase em em emissions reductions elsewhere. And usually that takes, the, some, takes the form of some kind of carbon sinking project like planting trees um, somewhere else in the state or in some crazy cases like California, you know, in other countries like uh, uh, in Brazil. Um, so for EJ, um, uh, EJ members of our coalition, this of course feels very risky because it's permitting continuing permission uh, emissions in often in their communities and um, those facilities are able to be compliant because they're purchasing emissions reductions somewhere else. And so that's very worrisome um, to communities where these emissions may be happening. And so EJ members of the coalition in particular fought very hard for what we call a set of EJ guardrails to be imposed on the carbon neutral offset program of the CLCPA. Um, and those guardrails include uh, a de just a rigorous um, application process for dem demonstrating technical non-feasibility of compliance. Um, as was mentioned, the electricity sector is precluded from eligibility. Um, uh, waste to energy, biofuels for energy and transport are, are, are not allowed as, as part of the offset program. Um, and then also geographic restrictions, offset projects must be based in the same county as the pollution source and within 25 miles. And also the DEC is required to create a registry of approved offset projects with a priority on projects that maximize public health benefits and environmental benefits within the state and especially localized health benefits in disadvantaged communities. So to, to the, as much as possible, we want any offsets purchased uh, in, in, the, in the CLCPA offset program to um, uh, generate localized public health benefits. Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll just point to toward the end of the bill, um, not really a lot of attention was paid to this, but it's actually extremely important because it's so sweeping. Um, there is both an, a climate screen and then an equity screen version of the same thing. Basically across all 
potential state actions like issuing of permits and licenses, other approvals, other decisions, um, grants, loans, other financial assistance, all state agencies and offices and authorities, one, shall not disproportionately burden disadvantaged communities um, as, as identified by the Climate uh, Justice Working Group that I referred to, and two, shall also prioritize reductions of greenhouse gas emissions and co-pollutants in disadvantaged communities. Um, and we've already um, um, uh, recommended uh, to, for the state energy plan that uh, uh, there must be included an application of this equity and EJ screen plan for the ongoing development of the state energy plan. So this gives kind of a requirement for the state in considering all of its actions to basically incorporate the EJ and equity principles of the CLCPA into its decision making. So what's next for New York? Um, what we need now is uh, to fight, to uh, you know, go back into the ring um, for massive dedicated year over year revenue, um, probably in the ballpark of about $30 billion annually um, to, is what we need to achieve the zero emissions economy required by the CLCPA. We also, um, in very much in the spirit of the CLCPA, we need to codify and securitize and with some form of, of, of uh, what we call a lockbox, um, a spending design for that revenue that embodies the equity and environmental justice principles and mandates of the CLCPA with a substantial share of that revenue being dedicated for the benefit of um, disadvantaged communities. New York Renews is now kind of gearing up and preparing to launch this exact fight um, hopefully heading toward major victory in the 2021 legislative session. So I just uh, leave some um, uh, contact info for those of you who want to learn more about New York Renews. And also if you want to get in touch with me directly to talk more specifically about how you might want to get involved. Thanks all for your time. Thank you, Lou. That was outstanding. Uh, Thank uh, all of the panelists for outstanding presentations. Um, uh, we'll do uh, just a couple of uh, quick questions. Um, running low on time, but I see our participants are largely still there. So thank you all for, for uh, tuning in on Earth Day and being with us. Um, one issue that got touched on, but not um, a lot of attention is batteries and storage. We've been talking a lot about uh, conversion and solar and renewables and wind uh, and the intermittency periods. Um, does anyone on the panel want to give us a little bit of an update as to the state of battery developments, what's happening there, where they're being used, what their capabilities are, and what their future needs will be? How much improvement uh, do we still need to make with regard to batteries? Well, Michael may know more about this, but um, I can tell you that, that it's a it, it's a big focus area for the state right now, NYSERDA, and uh, particularly the Department of Public Service. You know, with the intermittency of, of solar and wind, batteries are going to be really important for the grid. Um, but you also need to be thinking about thermal storage. Uh, the ability to uh, heat water at, at different times or thermal storage can also be different materials. So you can actually use the mass of your building, the concrete that's in your building to store energy for longer periods of time. So we've got uh, programs that are in the hundreds of millions of dollars that are rolling out um, you know, large scale uh, battery storage programs. So very focused on this issue. Uh, right. As I mentioned, the CLCPA has a requirement for a, a cons very considerable increase in storage capacity. The statute is agnostic on what kind of technology is used. And so we use the word battery, but there, as Greg mentioned, there are lots of, of different kinds of energy storage technologies that exist and many others are undergoing development. It's an area of intense uh, research and development all around the world. 
A number of uh, questions have come in about the presentations and we uh, have sent them around to everybody. So check your uh, inboxes for the presentations. They should be there. Uh, also, uh, the speakers' bios are there and contact information. Uh, so if you need to follow up, you can do so. And any presentations that weren't sent around, uh, if you want to have them, let us know. We'll try to make them available. Um, Peter, a uh, question came in about extending your analysis more internationally, where some developing countries may be um, using an even greater share of their landmass for uh, agriculture and the opportunities that uh, exist there and uh, our ability to share our experiences and research with um, countries that could use uh, some assistance. The good news is these are practices that are well known uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, as I mentioned, since very little of agricultural research has been devoted to uh, enhancing them and perfecting them, uh, there's still great opportunities to make them far more productive and more resilient. Uh, they have been used at virtually all crops, all regions, et cetera. So we know many of them work and have some track record, but in most places, they're still used at only a small fraction. Of course, in other countries, uh, you sometimes have the opposite issue where you have uh, sort of pre-industrial farming. So here, for example, the vast majority of meat are raised in CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, where all the animals are kept together and food is brought in from outside to feed them. And that creates a huge amount of waste, which is often poorly uh, handled, that creates tremendous pollution uh, and greenhouse gas impacts. Uh, by contrast, in other countries, you may have, like in the, you've probably been reading about in Brazil, extensive clearing of the forest for um, to graze cattle or to, for new land to grow soybean to feed cattle. And that is a, probably the most destructive uh, and way to uh, produce beef. And so uh, some countries are so much worse off than the U.S. that uh, we have other challenges there. It's not so much jumping to these agroecological practices, but very much getting away from these hyper-destructive practices. And uh, also, again, rethinking uh, the dietary choices that we're all making that is driving the deforestation in the Amazon, in the Congo, in Indonesia, uh, et cetera. So bottom line is yes, a lot of this is applicable in different ways, obviously different soils, different terrains, different crops, but the general concepts are certainly applicable. And the other general concept that is important that what is done in every country is not a result of a farmer, an independent farmer making an independent decision. That decision is very highly influenced by government policy, which affects the markets, uh, which affects the laws that the farmers and landowners act under. And so all of those uh, farmer choices can be heavily influenced by improved policies uh, in the US and in other countries. Thank you, Peter. Um, Matthew, uh, I think it's time that we, uh, we uh, thank all the panelists and have some closing remarks from you. And um, we will have achieved uh, a timely conclusion. Um, it's always good. Uh, thank you, Paul. So I, I do want to close today's program by saying thank you very much to all the really terrific speakers. We learned so much from each of you, and we were lucky to have you, especially in these unique circumstances. I uh, also want to thank my co-chairs, Carl, Kevin, Amy, as well as Lisa Bataille at the New York State Bar Association, the sponsors of today's event, and of course, the City Bar, especially Kevin, Martha, Loxley, and Kamran. You all helped transition what originally was planned to be a live event into a remote format. And I think it worked out really, really well. It went really smoothly. So thank you. Uh, most of all, however, I want to thank all the audience members. Uh, without you, of course, there would have been no program today. So thanks for uh, gathering today on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and spending part of your day with us. We've come a long way in this country since the first Earth Day in 1970, which, although I wasn't there, I understand was a, a joyous and life-affirming event. And uh, about 20 million people showed up to that first Earth Day, which is really remarkable today. 
Uh, I was very pleased at the amount of uh, people we had gathered for today's presentation, but uh, of course, there's nowhere near that. Uh, of course, significant environmental challenges remain, however, including especially climate change. Uh, speakers today have described some of the sources of the problems contributing to climate change and also offered blueprints for how to meet different aspects of this challenge. I, I hope their presentations and the program today will help serve as inspiration to you as we move forward, including to the next Earth Day. Uh, as we've learned during this pandemic, uh, now is not a time to despair, but a time to act. So let's all get to work. And uh, I want to say again, thank you very much and have a great Earth Day. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you all. We are concluded. Bye-bye.